Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Jim Cornette Experience, folks. If the rotten wrestling shows won't let us have any fun, we're going to make our own today. Vampire movies, wrestling history, and will TNA ever totally stop the action? And joining me, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you, he's changing his name to Total Nonstop Podcaster. The great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again. I understand AEW is also changing their name to their original name, Tony's Trust Fund. <laughs> it, I can't, I can't, if I only had time, as Thunderbolt would say. And I've, I've already told you, I'm a little, I'm a little snotty. Not in attitude, but in actual flimminess today. I'm a little, it's the weather's changing. Now it's going to be down in the 30s tonight. It's going to be 80 again this week. Half the trees have no leaves. The other half haven't even turned color yet. I was just in, in moments ago. Sounds like Walt Whitman. This is good. And no, this is more like Bob Ross. <laughs> and so moments ago, I was rolling in the in the grass in the follicles in the pollen with Harley Quinn trying to cheer her up she's been puny this morning and uh so I'm snotty and etc and I was telling you this and I say you know this is the weekend that I believe that I've just said I've I've had my Popeye moment I said I've had all I can stands and I can't stands no more these TV shows are blurring I'm going to I'm going to keep up with the as the bloodline turns. Of course the you know the, the the big story in the wrestling game. And I looked at what TNA or what TNA goddamn it. Well, <laughs> I'm predicting the future again. What uh AEW presented for 3 hours on a nationwide cable network last night. I I looked at the the Rick, they used to call them results. Now it's more like the fucking transcription is mostly promos and shit and gaga. And I say, you can't be serious. They expected people to watch that. So we're going to make fun of that from afar. Although I believe you actually did see some of this. Well, I had it on one of the monitors here in the office. I was working and I had the uh, Phillies Diamondbacks game on one of the TVs. That was an exciting game. They say Bryce Harper stole home. It was a double steal. It's not exactly the same as Jackie Robinson stealing home against Yogi Berra, but exciting game. You, you've, you've already gone to inside baseball for me. I don't, a double steal. Well, I don't know what the fuck. In the going. 1955 World Series, real quick, it's a funny story. Jackie Robinson stole home. Yogi Berra of the Yankees was the catcher. Flipped out like no one ever saw him flip out on the field. He said he got him. And... Fast forward to, let's say, 15 years ago, Yogi Berra is still alive. Jackie Robinson's widow, Rachel Robinson, is still alive. And they're at the Yogi Berra Museum. They greet each other, not with, hello, how are you? He says, out. She says, safe. <laughs> they say every single time, no matter who he's with, even if he's alone, if he walks by the photo in the museum, he says, out. So uh, stealing home's a big deal. But if it's a double steal, that means someone else was running to another base. It's not the same as an isolated steal of home. But my point was, there well, was lots I of see things to steal my attention. Well, it's all over again. There are lots of things to steal my attention away from AEW. So I had it on. I tried to listen to some of the promos. I saw what some of the matches were. I tapped out before the tag team in event. Oh, boy. Well, we'll, we'll go into some of this later on. But we do, ha we do have some fun and uh, entertaining things to talk about here on the program. But I want to, at the top, I want to read uh, an email that we got. And Brian, I think this went to, to me and to you. Um, so I think you've seen it. But, you know, <clears throat> when we talk about now the war is in Israel, before the war was in Ukraine, wherever the war is, usually for many of us, most people probably listening, it's something you watch on television or it's something you're seeing on the news or whatever you're reading or hearing the reports. And 
obviously a lot of people know someone who is maybe affected or know know someone, but we wouldn't normally think that our audience specifically would not only be affected, but be in the middle of it, you know, here at our humble little program, but we do obviously go all over the world and they've got access to what we're doing, but we got an email from Israel, uh, a fellow named Avaron. And he said, and obviously English, maybe a second language, I don't know here, but he says, hello, Jim and Brian. This is not the email I always wanted to send you. Since the morning of October 7th, I'm at war and I can't watch wrestling or listen to my two favorite podcasts, as I love to listen to your podcasts and omnibus on YouTube while I'm at work. I wanted to tell you about my fellow friend, brother, and professional wrestler, Ahmed Magnesi, who was brutally murdered at the Nova Music Festival in Israel on October 7th. He was 22 years old. And I was not aware, Brian, that they have not only wrestling in Israel, but a local wrestling community in Israel and promotions and local wrestlers. Yeah, I didn't know too much about that either. And, you know, you figure that most places you probably do have that, even if it doesn't get publicity. And, of course, we've always heard, you know, you didn't go to Israel when you were in world class, but the Von Eriks were massive over there. And wrestling became a big thing for every side to love. No matter what you believed in, no matter what side you were on, world-class championship wrestling was actually something that brought people together. Well, yeah, but again, that was the world-class program, and it became a big hit for, you know, whatever reason at the time. But that was, again, that was 40 years ago. Did that spawn a generation of folks interested in because world class only lasted a couple of years going over there well i don't know how long it was on so, over there but i don't think that's the only thing again wwf also had tours in the middle east and in israel at various points in the 80s so that early who knows what triggers yeah it was didn't we read something where it wasn't israel it was someplace it was like tony Gurria had a massive fan base in saudi arabia or something oh yeah but well, when, the point when they were presenting it to us in Dallas in '85 is like, oh, this is going to be groundbreaking. But and nevertheless, back to the the email. Um, he continued. Avaran continues to say, "I was a seasoned veteran in our small wrestling community when Ahmed first came through our doors. He was the nicest kid, always had a smile on his face, and he loved wrestling. We watched him grow up in front of our eyes and become a great heel. At his funeral, we joked that he'd probably be." watching us from above, and he cut a promo on all of us crying. His death tore our hearts apart, and he will never be forgotten. And that would just, you know, not only is it somebody, anybody in the middle of a war, but it's somebody that gets, that's in our wrestling community now, which is even smaller in the world. And, you know, just for no fucking reason. But that, I just wanted to recognize that. It just Please be safe, and uh, let's get the hostages home as safe as possible. But anyway, now we can talk about what I did yesterday evening. Because I will have you know, Brian, that yesterday, as we, as we sit here and speak to the people, was October 21st of 2023. Do you know why that date is a milestone of some description? 10, 21, 23? Of some description. Of some description? No. That doesn't necessarily have to be even. I don't know of any description, no. Well, if people sometimes give a description of you when the police sketch artist is around. Hey. But nevertheless, uh, yesterday was, would have been Mama Cornette's 90th birthday. Wow. And so what I decided to do, that's another reason I didn't watch any wrestling. Not that they were cooperating with me by trying to entice me in any fashion. Um, but uh, so what we decided to do was instead of having a birthday party, we would have a birthday evening in honor of Mama Cornette because the real, now that they, they won't give us a, a wrestling program on television these days on Saturday nights at 8 o'clock like they did for a while there. Um, 
we're back to uh, instead of DVRing and time lapse watching, we're back to Svingooli uh, at eight o'clock on Me TV. And guess what? His, and he's doing double features for the month of Halloween. That's right. We were going to say something. I'll let you finish first. Sounds like you have more important Spanguli related things to say than I do. Well, I was just going to say he's doing double features in the month of October, but the eight o'clock airing of Spanguli, guess what it was? I watched the second feature, which was Godzilla with Raymond Burr. What was the first one? The first one was The Night Stalker with Darren McGavin, the original TV oh, movie. Yeah, you know, I did know that because they're doing Kolchak next week. Yeah, and then they did and they did some of the TV episodes even more than normal all night. But nevertheless, the reason why that was special is because I remember exactly where I was when that movie first aired on television. Because I watched it with Mama Cornette. And that was January of 1972 when it first aired on ABC. How old were you? I would have was uh, 10 years old. Was that an appropriate movie for a 10-year-old? Oh, we loved her. I mean, she took me to see all the fucking uh, Christopher Lee Dracula movies from the late 60s in the theater. Really? Wow. Oh, we love scary movies. My cousin Larry. Larry liked scary movies. We called him Scary Larry. <laughs> 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 but no, my mom drove me and Larry downtown one time, and I still have these things, uh, because we had an 8 millimeter movie projector, and uh, Larry had seen a store downtown, second-hand store, that had some of the the movies that the the compilations, they're like cut down to like 8, whatever's on an 8 millimeter reel, what was it, 9 minutes? They turned House of Dracula from 1944 into fucking nine minutes of, you know, whatever. And there was no sound, but they had cool covers. And, oh, God, it wasn't Blackhawk Films. Who did the releases in the 60s I'm talking about? I don't know. Well, thank you, Mr. Expert. I'm not an expert on my Christopher Lee films from the 60s. Well, no, they, they, no this was the... Those films, uh, there weren't the Christopher Lee films. That was, they hadn't made some of those yet. No, this was in the, you're flummoxing me all up. In the mid-60s, with the horror movie craze kicked off by famous monsters of film land and the Hammer films, Horror of Dracula, Curse of Frankenstein. The Ghost of Mr. Chicken. The Ghost of Mr. Chicken, all the classics. They released a film company, released on home film, because there was no such thing as home videos, 8 millimeter film, of compilations of scenes from some of the classic 40s horror movies from Universal. And they had cool pictures on the covers, and you could watch nine minutes of this goddamn thing with no sound anytime you wanted to. But... <laughs> Where I was going with that was Mama Cornette drove me and Larry downtown to the store to, to buy those, and I still have them on my shelf today. And we'd sit there and watch nine minutes of the silent. But it was, you're watching a movie in your own home. This is unheard of. So where I, as a matter of fact, that's the topic I'm trying to talk to you about. Don't you see, Matthew, if you just listen to me. The TV movie, The Night Stalker, not only a landmark event, and me and Mama Cornette like scary movies. We watched The Ghost of Mr. Chicken together. Uh, but also, at that time, do you know that that was the highest rated TV made-for-TV movie in the history of television at that point in time? I did read that somewhere once, yeah. And it was, and it was a Dan Curtis production because he did the TV uh, series Dark Shadows and in the movies. And he did all those scary made-for-TV movies with the great music. Da -da -da -da. And it was a whole vibe going on. And I remember the commercials for this thing, Aaron. And these commercials built it up. They had the fucking vampire throwing people through goddamn windows. And Darren McGavin, this nut thinks he's a vampire. And the cool fucking music. And everybody, it did like a 33 fucking rating and a 40-something share. Which, for, for those of you novices out there that still ain't figured this out, 
back in them there days. Sit down with me, chillin'. Let me tell you about the old days of television. Thank you, chef. A 40-something share was 40-something percent of the people watching that had uh, watching television at that point in time were watching that program. So it was fucking monstrous. And then they came back with ABC again, came back the next year with Brian's song and shattered everything with the heart-rendering story of the friendship between Brian Piccolo and Gail Sayers. But so this fuck, and, and I've always loved this movie, and they, they got to show the follow-up. Sven, the Night Strangler. You got to show the, the, the follow-up the next year because that is an overlooked classic that never gets aired anywhere anymore. I've got a VHS tape, and that's something that I taped off the air. But that, that I love the idea that these big fucking movies, you know, it, it, television came full circle, and now the whole thing's shot to hell with all the streaming and the blah, blah, blah. I said watching movies used to be a big deal in your own home. But people forget about how big a deal a, a premiere movie on network television was uh, in the day when you couldn't just stream every goddamn thing that had ever been committed to film in 15 seconds. It's a shame we don't have that kind of community as a country anymore to all gather in front of the TV and watch Janos Skorzeny suck some blood out of some girl's neck. I mean, it's nice to have choice. <laughs> I mean, Ed Sullivan did monster ratings because there'd be like one act that people really wanted to see surrounded by a bunch of people that were lucky they were on TV sometimes. Well, now, hey, Topo Gijo. Sometimes. Topo Gijo. I like Topo Gijo. I get a kick out of it. It's such an awful act. It's so bad. <laughs> hey, what are you? Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Sarai, Sarai. Mama <laughs> Cornette used to do that. Mama Cornette used to do that whole bit. Sarai, Sarai. <laughs> She'd open up the pot on the stove. Sarai, sarai. Uh, but anyway, so we watched The Night Stalker is what we did, what I was trying to say, Stacy and Harley Quinn and I. And I fixed my world-famous chicken parmesan with my special marinara sauce and an incredible combination spicy and panko coating on the chicken, and we had that, and I had, and that's another, I got acid reflux today, hoo, 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 uh, I had two snappy pappies. Right, you know what I'm thinking, what the hell is that? A snappy pappy is my special version of a Bloody Mary, that's what Stacy calls them, is snappy pappies, because they're snappy, pappy, and I celebrated the occasion, I had two snappy pappies. Sounds like some kind of nickname at a sex club. Hey, Snappy Pappy's here. Hey, come on now. Don't... Let's Snappy a, Pappy in. This is a concoction that I'm drinking. Don't try to cast <laughs> aspersions on these things. But anyway, we had a pleasant night free of professional wrestling. It's what we did. What do you think of what's going on? Because I don't even know exactly what it is. They were doing a thing where they had people submitting videos to Sven Gulli. Now there's Gwen Gulli. And there's another guy, what's his name? Nostalgia for Ratu. Well, I, and then it's another one. And then it's another one. And all of a sudden these characters have popped up and it's almost like they're hosting in stead of uh, Sven Gulli. Or in his stead, maybe I should say better. What do you think? Well, I think he's, he's now, he's the, he's much like Kevin Sullivan was when he was the master. He's a ringleader of freaks and and various weirdos, and, and Svengoolie reigns herd over them, but it also, because they've, they've increased his airtime because his show is so popular, but the movies, <laughs> unfortunately, they can't create an extra 30 minutes of the fucking movies, so they, they are branching out into more action and excitement down there in the, in the dungeon. And, and to answer your question, I think not nostalgia for Ratu, I'm not sure that one rolls right off the tongue and is really going to catch on. I'm not sure about the merchandising 
uh, future of that. But Gwen Gooley, Stace and I were both remarking, seems to be a healthy young woman, very talented and perky. As we once, JR and I once described Terry Runnels, a.k.a. Marlena, full of spunk. She's a spunky girl. And, and, and we're fans. I think because of the popularity of the show, they should just have Sven Gulli do wraparounds of every shingle, every shingle, every shingle, every shingle. What do you want him to get in a roofing business now? Every single show on the network. Well, see, here's the thing. The poor man, he's already, he's, he's been coming out of a coffin every night for 40 years. And that's got to take its toll. And now you're asking him to just at this, at the, the twilight of his career when he's looking forward to, you know, just laying around the graveyard and just watching the, the sun go down or potentially just watch the fog or whatever he likes to watch. And you're wanting to take on all these outside projects. Wraparounds. I said wraparounds. One rap, day, rap, one day well, a you... month, shoot your local promos and then go home. Oh, on every show on the fucking network? I mean, there's only so many shows they have in... The rotation right, the right network, now. There's only 24 hours in a day, seven times every week. So come in once a month. You can do. Well, he now uh, has how many three hours stooges. Is that? He now huh? has stoo He now has stooges. Well, uh, see now that's there. You've come to the realization. I was just trying to tell you. They're there to so he can maneuver over the group without having to actually micromanage everything. He's got graves to dig, or rob, or whatever. He doesn't rob the chickens I don't think, to throw. Yeah, I don't think that's his thing. I don't think he robs graves. That's well, like it seems like now he never had time before, but now he's got <laughs> some of the burden off his. He's been carrying that network for 40 fucking years. And now he can go out and rob some graves and steal some corpses and put some monsters together. Can you imagine the local story on the news? Like, <laughs> local Gooley celebrity, Sven Gooley, was arrested robbing graves <laughs> <laughs> at St. Mary's. <laughs> <laughs> Here's his comment while being taken away. What did you expect? <laughs> oh my god. Oh, you know, he, he said the, the, the best part about that is he's such a kind, well thought of member of the community, and everybody loves him. And he's he, nice to everybody, donates his time. If that if if they did find out he was doing a Dahmer in his freezer, oh, that would be fucking great. Well, not great, uh, but hysterical. But no, not... it would be well it, <laughs> ironic, as the kids say. That's right. It would be ironic. Speaking of ironic, he Brian, needs, he needs to put Monster Squad on there. He needs more movies. You said oh, more things in the rotation. Are Monster you gonna, Squad. Do they send you a check? You still haven't watched it. How many DVD copies did you get sent? I a number of them. It was almost like it became a harassment thing. I had to report some people to the FBI. That was you. <laughs> But never again. I, I wish that you, I wish that you looked like at our show, like you look at Monster Squad. Well, you are my Frankenstein. All right. Well, you're not my Elsa Lanchester either. How about that? I'll take it. And I, when I was a kid, I thought her name was Elsa, Elsa Lancaster. What did I just say, Lanchester? Lan Lanchester. Lanch. Well, that's what her name is. Elsa Lanchester. You got me right? confused. I don't know what you're But I thought it about. was Lancaster. Oh. You know, in now, you've got, now you've thrown me off. In Monster Squad, because it's not a universal picture, oh, they had to change all the monsters. So the creature from the Black Lagoon just is Gilman. And like even Frankenstein, like they couldn't put the bolts in the same place that the universal bolts would be in his neck. They had to move things around and... Monster Squad, you will be watching it soon for You know, it would seem like that if you, you could put bolts in somebody's neck, and what if he has to wear a halo? What if on the set of the movie he broke his neck? They say, we got to put him in a halo at the hospital, and in comes the lawyers say, no, don't screw it in there. Something to think about. I didn't think about that. See, that could affect United States health insurance, health insurance requirements <laughs> and laws. What? What are you laughing at? <laughs> no, I, no, it, it could affect health insurance. Uh, health in health insurance. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I was, where I was trying to go a second ago was probably as silly as what we've been talking about. Am I, I wake up to the, 
news on the interwebs, the announcement this fine morning that Impact Wrestling is going to be changing their name, of their, the name of their promotion, and the new name of Impact Wrestling at some point in early 2024 is going to be TNA Wrestling. Total nonstop action wrestling. So, Brian, we can discuss this, but in, in summation at the start of it, have they created a situation where the reason that they changed the name of TNA Wrestling to begin with back in, oh, those many years ago, was because it had become synonymous with fans as a Drek wrestling promotion and had been laughed at by potential sponsors or business partners as tits and ass wrestling. And they changed the name of it to Impact to get away from that because, of course, as we have come to be made aware of, the original idea for that sophomoric name was from Shit State himself out in, uh, out in the wilds of Colorado. Is that where he lives? He, he, he came back to Indiana for a while and left in a huff for some reason. But nevertheless, they changed the name of the promotion to Impact Wrestling to get away from that. That it was, it was a, a, a connotation of a crummy, failed wrestling promotion with a sophomoric name. And then they have now, in the past 10 or so years, created a situation where people are nostalgic for the crummy, shitty wrestling promotion that they had to change the name of because what they've done since then has been so much worse? Is that what we are supposed to be led to? Or are they just stuck in a time loop and they've got on your goddamn Mox Moog synthesizer and your fucking whatever the fuck else you had today, the 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 uh, the Moogs and the Voogs that you were talking about before we went on the air. What was it? The, the, the elements of things you remember, the Vox Continental and the Moog, or uh, well, different people pronounce it different ways, but those are not what I play on the show. The synthesizer. What I have here is the Hydrosynth. Some dramatic music for Jim while he talks, but... Some dramatic music for you while you think of an answer. What in the wide, wide world of sports are these people doing? The name TNA was around their neck like an albatross, and they figured they would get rid of it, rebrand themselves, give everyone a fresh way to interpret the show or treat the show, and it's somehow so much worse than even TNA was that people are now like, yes, let's go back to that other garbage. <sighs> this is a puzzling move. I mean... They spent time and at least some money. I don't, they don't have a big budget on branding and everything the last several years. From what I've heard from people involved with the company, they've had a string of recent successes. Again, not major things, but maybe they're running more in tune with the venues that Tony Khan should be looking at. Smaller venues, they've done well. They do have some names that people know. The problem is, and in a lot of ways always has been, the creative and the leadership. And that's something that impact has always been lacking. They don't have a good creative person there. They don't have anyone with a good creative backbone. They there. just had a big show and they had a, an intergender battle Royal where apparently people came in a, a Royal rumble homage where people come in one at a time and they would send randomly males and females in and the girl won the thing. Which one, Scott Demore? I do, oh, <laughs> oh, he did something nice for somebody a couple years ago, so cut him some slack. But never, but no, seriously. But a girl won the fucking Royal Rumble over a bunch of men. There were more men than girls in this thing. It's it, they've they were doing murder mysteries a few years ago. But that that's a thing they've never had. The uh, since uh, again since Jeff Jarrett left the company, they've never had a coherent direction they had a coherent direction at one point just not coherent television because of you know who but 
they went through the the Hogan debacle where all of him and all of his friends, like Fat Albert the Cosby kids, showed up for a while, and then they did the deal with where they changed their name to Global Force Wrestling, and then changed it back six months later, and then migrated to Canada as part of their, you know, anthems conglomerate. And now that they've they've exhausted all other possibilities, let's go back and, and start it all over again. I do, it, I forgot all about Global Forces. You were just going through the history. That's well, another, like you see, it was yeah. only a six month period of time, and then they just, just okay, no, never mind. And then they six more years later, they do well. Fuck it, we'll just. Go back to the other way. Yes, there were more people watching wrestling overall back then on television. So uh, TNA during what, uh, 07, 08, 09, as I recall, since I would have knowledge that because I gave a shit because I was halfway, I halfway gave a shit because I was there. They had one and a half million people or somewhere around about that. For the big events uh, or the big television shows, one million more than Tony has now because there are more people watching wrestling. WWE had much more. But uh, it otherwise is, uh, again, then does that just tell the people who were nostalgic for TNA? Well, yeah, they, they're calling it TNA, but it was better 15 years ago. Do they bring back the six-sided ring? And no, I, I read one of the reports that I read was everybody universally agreed no, because it fucking hurts. It's e the regular ring is easier on everybody's body. Nobody missed it. Fans don't care. Fans don't care. Just get in the well, six-sided ring and flip around. Well, and that's part of the problem. It, it just, so I don't, again, I don't see how going back to what you were doing that didn't work low those many years ago and you had to change your name to begin with again now they've created a situation where people are nostalgic for horse shit boy i i remember when that horse shit that i eat tasted good should they bring in dixie and jeff jarrett uh well should, should russo get another shot no unfortunately jeff is under contract somewhere else i i'm hoping that dixie has uh got the wrestling bug out of her bonnet because it wouldn't do any good to bring Dixie in unless Dixie has, how are Bob and Janice? Are they in good health? Unless Dixie has come into a large inheritance, nobody would want Dixie at a wrestling promotion. She was there for her pocketbook, which was taken away by her parents. So now the question is, does anybody want to book Bob and Janice? I mean, no, I think that's his, that's as far as they're and I think everybody universally would agree that no, they don't they don't want shit stain. So uh, you, that's as far as they can go. They can't re they can't bring the old gang back together again. What do you think of it? Uh, you know, again, <sighs> I don't understand why the, the I think there was a quote that we keep hearing. TNA chance when we go to some of these shows. Well, then you fucked up, haven't you? Because the name of your promotion has been Impact for 10 fucking years. Yeah, why, and, not, why not change your name to This Is Awesome Wrestling then? If we're going yeah, based on chance. Because think about this. <laughs> were the people in, in 1993 in the garden chanting for Bruno? Eh? Huh? Eh? Huh? No. Is this more akin, though, to people going up to Vince McMahon at the gas station and saying, when they saw you there, I missed the Midnight Express, and him saying, I have an idea. We'll bring back the Midnight Express. Well, I, see, that that's the thing is that you can't, you can't go by what, if they're going to house shows and they're doing better, they said they're, 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 they've been picking up. Maybe they're attendance what or whatever. I heard they just did a show over here in... Uh, I always get Poughkeepsie and White Plains mixed up, but I apologize. I think it was White Plains. Uh, it was their anniversary show recently, and I heard they did really well. 
Okay, well, here's the the thing is, if you're getting more fans suddenly than you have been in a while, that means you're getting people that hadn't been to one of your shows in a while. And maybe it might have been since the last time that they were called TNA Wrestling. So maybe that's it. Hey, everybody, TNA, TNA. You can't then, well, shit, we ought to just change our name back. Try to expose the, it was always TNA Impact Wrestling. Just uh, try to get your goddamn brand that you've been working on most of the time for the last 10 years over a little bit better by, I don't know, having bigger stars, not letting girls win your fucking battle royals, beat your guys. A different whatever, tone of booking. That, see, that's the problem. Whatever else foolishness that they're always doing over there. The, the, were they time traveling at one point? They did do a murder. It, 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 all, that, all that Matt Hardy shit started there. The Matt Hardy shit. What? And they've gone through. Some people are going to. Oh well, now they concentrate on the rat. Well, maybe that's what they're doing now. But they've done all this shit, and people are just kind of fucking fed up with the whole thing. To be honest with you, on any mainstream basis, that's why nobody watches the shit anymore. It's always been a company that followed what else was happening, never a leader. And that's the problem. Too many people follow along, whether it's following what WWE does, and that means the introduction of more comedy, more silliness, beyond the normal everyday gimmicks of traditional wrestling, or whether that's following the independence, which is just throw anything out there. It doesn't matter what it is. As long as it gets a cheap pop or two, and as long as the audience wants to play along. And when you mix those things together, you get. Again, just an endless talent show of garbage and bad entertainment and bad booking that just feels like something below the level of what they're chasing. Because it's like Jim Hurd saying, let's all of a sudden have all these characters, because that's what WWE does. They're the industry lady. The smart thing to do is to find out what they're doing and copy it and come up with our own version of it, as opposed to, there's another way to do it which is to present the best possible thing for maybe a more serious-minded audience. But everyone goes the other way. Everyone goes towards stupidity and bad segments and bad creative, and it comes from the top. You need good people at the top. Who's going to be the person that's going to try to tell me that Scott Demore knows what he's doing as a creative person? He doesn't. And no one else there does either that's been in a position to make any change. So you can change your name to whatever you want. <laughs> You know, at the end of the day, it's now being rebranded after something Vince Russo admitted was tits and ass wrestling. Yes. That they lied to Jerry Jarrett about. And is it going to help anything at the end of the day? You know, at least the NWA got on CW, apparently. Impact's on a channel owned by Impact that has no viewers. More people will hear this several times over than will watch their program this week. So does it all matter at the end? I don't know. I think if you're going to rebrand, you have to just ask yourself, what are you doing? How many times can you rebrand? How many times can you change? If you really want change, you really have to make change. And it starts at the top. Uh, you know, uh, also, <laughs> I've told you the story before. It may have been a while. I don't know if we've told it on the air even. But when in 2006, they were starting to run live events and house shows, and I had just started working with TNA with Jeff and Dutch, and they wanted to come to Louisville, and so I promoted the live event in Louisville. As and I, the first thing that I did was when I went to the local cable system. They weren't even Spectrum then. I can't even remember the goddamn name this far back, but I wanted to buy spots on. Raw and SmackDown, and because they were at that at the time, I think at the time both of them were on cable, or maybe did we get right? Nevertheless, and I also wanted to buy our programs, so that we would have a specified localized live event commercial airing in Impact on Spike, right? But when I first walked in there, you told, told the guy, yes, I'm with TNA Wrestling. 
the first thing he thought was tits and ass. And he giggled. And I said, no, no, it's total nonstop action wrestling. And he's like, oh, sure, okay. And it that was not an isolated incident. It was the only time I underwent it with, in, with a business meeting because I didn't have anything to do with TNA's fucking business, thankfully. But it, just trying to do that that show with them, that was one of the first reactions I got was the TNA wrestling because it was Vince Russo's childish concept of uh, sexuality and or interaction with the opposite sex because I believe, as I was mentioned, and this is not slander or hearsay, this was uttered by his own chicken lips to me when we were both in our mid-30s, that he had never had intimate relations with anyone other than his wife because they were childhood sweethearts. And I maintain to this day that that's not only unnatural, but unhealthy and probably led to his childish and adolescent view of Sable and all of the fucking girls calling each other bitches and hoes and whatever the fuck, because his development was arrested by his lack of any experience whatsoever in doing any goddamn thing for fun. But I digress, don't I? I, I love the fact that the idea was, you know, we'll have these things, but we got to code the name, but people will know because of the name, the initials. Yeah, remember what is he? He had girls dancing in cages at the, <laughs> on the either side of the entranceway in the first TNA shows from Nashville when they were just yes. on pay per view. That was his fucking mentality that the wrestling fake, because he never went to any of these places. If you've, I would love to see you put Vinny Rue in a fucking strip club and see him goddamn. His pants would be baggy from the amount of piss that he had fucking released in them. But he th <laughs> the cool people like that listen to the Howard Stern show, they they like women with big tits and cages and wrestling and fucking midgets jacking off in trash cans because that's where he's at. And that's what TNA wrestling, the... <laughs> The brand, unfortunately, sounded like to normal people who hadn't heard of this new upstart company. At least uh, Tony's name, All Elite Wrestling, doesn't... That sounds just fine to the average fucking radio station guy or whatever, right? It's not like tits and ass wrestling. Hey, I'm going to go check out that new wrestling promotion. Oh, yeah, what are they called? TNA Wrestling. TNA Wrestling. Tits and ass. You gotta come. It'll be tits and ass. It's yes. such a stupid thought that anyone would be excited about that. And 20 years after that, it was a rib by a, a, a emotionally arrested individual with a lack of experience in vaginal fucking navigation. <laughs> it's back. Whoever they do business with, how do you have that conversation? Listen, we're rebranding ourselves again. <laughs> Remember we told you all the reasons why it was better to get away from TNA? We lied. We lied. We actually love TNA. We're going back to TNA. Are they keeping Impact? Will Impact be the show still? Or I think, yes, it's TNA Impact Wrestling. Total nonstop action Impact Wrestling. Now, now we're starting to get too long for the marquee, aren't we? Maybe it's a marketing issue. <laughs> you know, you guys spent all this time branding yourselves as Impact, and you're just dropping it like that? Maybe there's a marketing problem, too. Maybe there's well, nothing know, but problems there. <laughs> you know, they, they used to have a great PR and marketing department. There's this woman named Dixie Carter. That's how... Oh, wait. I, I have a press release here. Actually, they just put out something right now. In order to capitalize on the excitement we have seen from TNA fans, we're moving back to standard definition. This week... <laughs> On HDTV, we'll be in standard definition this point going forward. See all your favorite stars, much cheaper, I mean, in standard definition, from Lenny Asper's Folly. And, and, and then the next week, they're going to announce they've hired a new director, and to give them a more gritty and raging bull-like feel, they're going to start broadcasting in black and white. <laughs> <sighs> will, um, will John Gerberic be returning to the company? Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> what other legends of TNA? And by the way, on that topic, I will say one nice thing they did. They put Mike Tenay and Don West in their Hall of Fame. And that is actually something really cool because everyone yes. I've ever known who's known either of them has said wonderful things about them. And I second all of those emotions. And yay, they do something nice up there. Sooner or later, even a blind squirrel finds a nut. But it was classy. And I'm sure that Mike obviously would have insisted had they not offered that Don be a part of that. But uh, that that's nice, and we're not we're not taking a piss out no, of that induction at all. at all. No, well-deserved there, but maybe not so well-deserved. Do you think you'll ever get an invite to the TNA, formerly Impact, Hall of Fame? I'm hoping that they've lost my address and contact <laughs> information. And, but I could say it was, it was lost, in, unless they send it registered, then I could say it was lost in the mail, right? It wouldn't be, make me rude. Not rude, no. Not rude. It wouldn't make you rude. Not it wouldn't ruin my <laughs> reputation with them. Well, Brian, I wonder if they take some wagers on whether TNA is going to change its name to something else over at DraftKings, our friends over there that are the official sports betting partners of the NBA. See, you know what? They were the partners of the NFL. Are they cheating on the NFL, or are they also in addition to in a polyamorous? A situation with the NBA. I think it's a standard agreement with another entity that is not in conflict with the prior entity, so they could all coexist together, not necessarily having sexual relations with each other, whatever you're trying to intimate there. I didn't connotate anything like that, but hey, basketball is back. Well, that's why they're, they're partnering. Now, see, they're hopping from one sport to another as they play these things. That's why the folks at DraftKings Sportsbook are on top. Not only Mommy's always on top, but also DraftKings is on top because they are the premier facility for you to place wagers, as we mentioned, on the National Basketball Association, and they're celebrating the arrival of basketball back. They're doing it again this year. It was so popular last year with an unbeatable offer where new customers can get $200 instantly in bonus bets for merely plunking down five bucks on the NBA and win or lose, it doesn't matter. You're still going to get that instant $200 in bonus bets. So you're going to start out with a win right off the bat. And with the DraftKings parlays, see, I used to have a parlor, but they turned it into a parlay. Everybody's got a shot at even bigger basketball wins. Does that mean, what, it, has there ever been a situation, Brian, where in the middle of a, the finish of a basketball game with 30 seconds left another basketball team hit the court and jumped one of the teams and caused a disqualification has there ever been a run-in like that there hasn't been but i think if there was and you said the last minute it probably wouldn't be at 30 seconds it would probably be with much less time because again there's a lot of timeouts at the end so it the last 10 seconds of a basketball game could take eight minutes well, so that in, in actuality, what we've done then is somebody, some basketball coach out there ought to have a great idea. If you've got a rival team that you're really pissed off at, bring your players in hidden in fucking cloaks and hoodies and things and huddle them in a closet or a corner until the last five seconds of the game and then run them out on the court and have them kick the shit out of the team you're mad at. And imagine what the neutral team will think. And folks, if you'd like to see stuff like this, then no, go right no, now. No, you will not see any stuff like this, and this has nothing to do with DraftKings. Well, you would got to go right now and download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use the code JCE to get the uh, $200 in bonus bets we talked about, and you can find out whether you can place a wager on whether that Boston is going to hit the court on Charlotte and beat up fucking Dallas. See, all the, uh, basketball's more fun when you're in on the action, Brian. So I don't you got to start booking these things right. Once again, download uh, the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use the code JCE. You get $200 in bonus bets instantly for betting just $5. For heaven's sake, that's a 40 times your money. I wonder if you bet $100, would they give you 40000 or whatever that might be? Well, that might be too much complicated mathematics. What do you think of my idea? If one of the coaches had his team hidden and they hit the, the fucking court and just, I mean, just start wailing on them with chairs, 
kicking the shit out of them. I think it would be entertaining TV. I also think everyone involved would be suspended. We would never see them play ever again. How are they getting into the building? How is this entire team, no matter if they're in uniform just, or not? Just, no, just take the five main guys. The five the starters? Yeah, just the five main guys. The starting get, five get, is going to go out there and fight own. the entire other team? Well, no. What you do is you you fucking you arrange a deal where the rest of the bench has been ejected. See the rest of the arrange, bench. Is, no, I don't see. How do you arrange that? Well, you just book it that way, and then when the referee says you're out of there, it's just five on five on the court, and then the other five come in and beat the shit out of the 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 other five while the other five stand there and. And fucking don't have a dog in that fight. Cause so I'm guessing you want to do this against an away team because if it's a home team, the home fans may run onto the court and help out. Well, see, that would... Boy, when that got on the news, the house next week would be fucking insane. So right now, folks, the crown is yours. Go download the DraftKings Sportsbook app right now. Use the code JCE. Get the extra 200 bucks. Everybody... And then, and then win all your bets and arrange a run in so that you can win the, the, the ultimate parlay and you can string together multiple bets from the same game or build your parlay across multiple games. See if you build the parlay across multi, it goes from one game to the other and you can walk across it. That way you don't get wet. So right now do that. <laughs> do, do what? <laughs> Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. If you know how to download apps, Brian, tell the people, for those of you who don't know how to download an app, how do you download an app? I'll wait. For the seven of you out there who don't know how to download an app, open the smartphone that you may or may not have and go to the app section or the app application, I guess, technically open it and get whatever you want. Wait a minute. You got to have an app to get the apps. Well, they usually, I mean, technically, I guess you're clicking an app, an icon to open the screen with all the apps so you can get the apps. Well, it seems like that if the person who held the the ownership of the app that you need to get all the other apps could just goddamn blackmail these other people to fucking kingdom come. That is what Apple does. No, no, I kid. Um, but we're back to DraftKings. And again, if you have something you want to put some money on, yes. make some money on, Yes, don't if, bet on this program being fucking professional in any way, shape, or form. The official betting partner of the Jim Cornette Experience, DraftKings. One more time, what's that promo code, Jim? J-C-E is the promo code when you download the app for DraftKings Sportsbook from the app app that you have to download the apps. The crown is yours! Hopefully the app is too. <laughs> and remember... Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY, parenthetically, 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available. For problem gambling, call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, parenthetically, KS, oh, that's Kansas. Licensee partner, Golden Nugget, Lake Charles, Louisiana. What a shithole that was. Uh, the town, not the particular Golden Nugget Lake. 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. We are all void in Ontario. Empty headed and without thought. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. How long is that in dog years? See sportsbook, sportsbook.draftkings.com slash basketball. For terms, for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms and responsible gaming resources, loud noises and multiple words, period. All right, and now we are going to, well, I at least am going to read a transcription of what happened on the AEW collision program on Saturday night, October 21st, while I was watching my man Svengoolie on MeTV, and you have some element of live experience uh, of this program while it was on in the background and it looks like it it's something that was best left in the background according to what i'm reading but um it looks like brian danielson and andre had a very lengthy very competitive match with a lot of moves in it 
Yes, that would indeed be correct. <laughs> and the crowd reminiscent of a crowd from Tokyo many years ago sat in silence, intently watching good portions of it. But there's nothing wrong with that if it's actually good action. But it's not a match. You know, it's not a thing with heat. Heat's not really something that exists here. It's just an athletic contest that you're going to enjoy. Kind of like a tennis match between two people that you don't really have a vested interest in either way. You're kind of watching the ball go back and forth. Or a tennis exhibition. Even even better. Now, they're, they're in Memphis, Tennessee, they're, but they're at the FedEx Forum, which is, I guess, still the big building in town. And they ain't been doing so hot lately, so was it a case of a piss hole in a snowbank crowd kind of contributing to the funereal atmosphere in the arena or they just they just well because i guess afterward these two baby faces because they shook hands and held each other's hands up after the match am i correct on this that's right in appreciation for the hard fort fort the hard fought effort there was an appreciation effort there was an appreciation between the two parties well good because at least they had some sportsmanship before apparently now, from what, again, I'm being led to believe by this transcription, the House of Black leader himself, Malachi Black, is back in control of the lighting system in the arena. Because the lights oh went out, and then they come back on, and Malachi Black kicks Brian Danielson with a fucking kick, with a foot, and knocks him out, colder than a banker's heart. This may have been the most amount of light. I don't know what you call it. Lights going on and off. Light manipulation. Being... This is the most amount on one television show. And I tuned out before the main event match. So I don't know what happened there. And uh, for the record, as of 19 hours ago, according to WrestleTix, there were 439 available tickets for Memphis with a setup of 3,128. Whoa! And 2,689 were the amount of tickets distributed. The FedEx Forum seats like 15,000, 16,000, right? Do the, the Memphis NBA team plays there? Help me. It's a gigantic building. It's a big building. It's a All big right, building. well... And you know what doesn't help, too? You see SmackDown the night before. They're packed everywhere they go, and they show it to you nonstop. And yeah. it looks impressive because you're like, man, the upper, upper decks are filled up and lit. You don't see that in AEW. It's just, it's like getting, the area they can show on camera is getting smaller and smaller <laughs> by the episode. Pretty, pretty soon they're going to have the overhead from like the ring light shooting down so you can see the first four rows are filled up around ringside. Put the hard camera in the left corner. <laughs> That's, that'll be the sign. Well, but there was more light manipulation. Because yes. the lights went out, Malachi, the lights came back on, Malachi Black is there, he knocks out Daniel Bryan with a kick, then the lights go out again, and while Claudio and, and Useless get there to help their friend too late, and then they come back up and Black is gone, but they're still there. And they must, why are you loaning Malachi Black your time travel machine? No, that's not time travel. That's light manipulation. We just discussed it. That's chip well, but he, machine, no, he's got the, the, He's manipulating the lights, but, but just because the lights go out doesn't make you disappear. You've got to be manipulating some kind of time and spatial rules as well to be able to transmogrify well, yourself and transcommunicate yourself and transphobify yourself from one place to the other. From what I understand, during his time away, which may or may not have been injury-related, depending on who you talk to, uh, he spent time with Tommy Rich, and he learned where to hide beer under the ring. <laughs> so when the lights go out, he's not really disappearing. He's running under the ring to uh, have a good time. The Pabst Blue Ribbon. All righty. Well, anyway, uh, then apparently Sky Blue beat uh, Hollywood Haley J uh, from OVW. I guess now OVW, they're supplying. Well, I can't say job guys because she's not a guy. So job personnel for these efforts i'm sure you like sky blue you know it's all right you know they're kind of making her more heelish i mean the AEW women's division just runs around rudderless i don't know what the hell's going on what do you think of the idea i guess this is two weeks in a row now 
Shivani is now the lead announcer on Collision. Kevin Kelly is just the third guy in the booth. What the f- well? I'm fortunately since I haven't really noticed uh, up until now, but now that you've pointed it out to me, if I ever see this program again, I'll never be able. to. Why? Why would you do I don't that? Know. You had a fresh, different announced team on the Saturday night show that you launched that was different than the Wednesday night, and it it ain't the announcing team or the announcers or any individual announcer it's going to determine whether they watch one program or the other if they're thinking well they watch more people watch wednesday and tony's on wednesday therefore it must be true that if we put tony on saturday it'll increase the viewership i think not well part of the problem too is it's not like okay give me the lead commentating spot on collision by the way shivani's doing what jim ross thought he did behind the scenes years ago but it's not like he's just saying give me the uh Announcing spot on collision, make me the main guy there, and I'm going to do a main commentator's job. He's still doing, like, David Crockett 2023. <laughs> Just, oh, look at him. Oh, look at him. He's great. Oh, yeah. That's not good. That's not good at all. But, you know, it pays to have the relationship with Tony Khan that Tony Schiavone has made sure that he's had. Well, now, we're not insinuating that he's he's gone down like a circus seal for Tony or anything. I'm, insinu- that I'm insinuating he's a, he's a stooge for Tony Khan, and he always has been. Okay, well, yeah. it's different than being a stooge and a... And not just a, Tony a, Khan. But. A receptacle for any type of protuberances. Anyway, then apparently the gun boys, part of the gang, bang, bang, gang, gang, bang, bang, gang, gang? Uh, beat uh, the Outrunners. And it, it, are they called the Outrunners because they grew up without indoor plumbing and every time they needed to go, they had to go out and run because it was cold? I'm just, I'm stretching here. I'm I'm reaching. Why are they the Outrunners? Oh. What are Outrunners? What do Outrunners outrun? Or do the, is it an outboard motor type of situation? Have, did their gear explain this? They didn't outrun the bad booking. Apparently, they weren't very fleet of foot. The, gun, uh, the, the gun, guns are, though. I mean, you know, th- there's so much wrong with AEW right now, and the Bullet Club Gold's presentation, I think, has you know had some issues lately. But the guns keep getting better and better, and they're the type of team that they do a lot, and you can't take your eyes off them, but they have to be heels because they're so obnoxious, and it works well for them. Yes. I agree with all of that. Then they're very animated. But then, apparently, after they won from the Outrunners, uh, the lights went out again. And there was a man in a devil mask in the back, and then the lights went out again. And then, I guess, they went on. What? So now, why would this be MJF, or if, if not MJF, who is this? And do you do no. you wonder if we're going to care? You know it ain't MJF because he ain't going to Memphis on a Saturday. No, uh, we don't know. We don't know who it is. Hey, if Gridley's Barbecue was still open, I bet I bet he would. Again, if it's not, and we have no reason to think up to this point that it would be, if it's not Malachi Black, then why even do that here? Because Malachi and the House of Black had control of the lights in two other segments. So this is three segments where the lights are going off and on. This time the devil. So I guess either the devil or the House of Black. Are the House of Black under the devil? I guess that's part of the question you have to wonder now. Who knows, Who knows what this is other than bad? Is there is there a room to rent in the House of Black so that maybe somebody else could come into the group that we'd be more interested in. All right. um, Apparently, uh, Dave Brown, the legendary Memphis announcer, who's one of the nicest human beings in the world, was invited to come to this production, and they put him on commentary for a Memphis street fight match with Jeff Jarrett against Eddie Kingston. And again, this is why I t- Tony's booking is much like you were talking about Impact's booking earlier with a a big budget and the ability to just do any whim that they want to do. But because Tony 
is an old video wrestling mark of these things. He's seen the Tupelo concession stand brawl. Jeff Jarrett's father ran Memphis. We'll have a Memphis street fight and have a garbage match with a bunch of fucking furniture and gimmicks and a bunch of interference and a bunch of blah, blah, blah. And we'll have all our talent involved in all of this chaos and lunacy for no fucking reason than except that we're in Memphis and the boss booker is a mark. And we'll make Dave Brown talk about it. Can you imagine what Dave Brown thinks about any of this shit? Part of the problem is, even if it all had worked out perfectly, Dave Brown's an older guy now. Even in his younger days, he was not a screaming announcer. If you think of any great Memphis brawl, not to take anything away from Dave Brown, you think of Lance Russell calling the action. Oh, look at what's going. You don't think of Dave yeah. Brown doing that. That wasn't his role. And even when Lance left, it was Corey Macklin doing the arena matches and doing the brawls in the arenas, not Dave Brown. So you brought him in to do something that really wasn't his thing to begin with. He's a little more subdued now than he was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, obviously. It's like, we have this legend here. How can we use him in the worst way possible? <laughs> Again, if you want to have him out there to do something, give him a match to do something. Why this match? It made no sense. And by the way, how many matches in AEW has your boy Jeff Jarrett had ketchup or mustard sprayed on him uh, yeah. in the last year? Because, again, Tony is narrow casting to the... And I love the old Memphis tapes, right? But Tony is narrow casting to the young fan who likes silly fake wrestling that has heard about the crazy stuff they did in Memphis 40 years ago and doesn't understand that this is completely the opposite of how it was presented and what it was done and why it got over and, and the whole nine yards. It's just a display of chaos, which Jeff is happy to do, I guess, for whatever compensation he's being provided for being in the middle of all this shit. <sighs> did you watch this at all? No. I'm I've literally I'm reading the recap. I'm seeing this shit. I don't intend to. I've, I've it's been a family weekend for once. I'm spending some time with Stacy and Harley instead of fucking Tony and fucking Goofy. Well, the issue is more Jeff and all of his people. This street fight it ended up being Eddie Kingston versus five people. <laughs> no one came out to help in the ring. Like in the ring, Eddie was like battling Jeff and Lethal, and Sanjay at the same time with the giant on the apron, and Karen running around. It was almost too much <laughs> happening. Even if you even if you just want the standard thing of, I hate the heel, they won Dosh Garnet, or Gosh, Dosh Garnet. Dosh Garnet? Gosh darn it! You know what? Dosh Garnet was a hell of a fucking MMA fighter, I'll tell you that. Out of Bulgaria, I believe. But it was just, there was so much going on. Eddie lost. It, it was really, really bad booking. It was a bad match, but the fact that it came down to Eddie Kingston versus five people and no one out there to help him, really bad stuff. But it says he won. He didn't win. Oh, well, wait a minute. It says Jarrett covers for the pin and win, and then winner. Uh, I've, I've read it wrong. All right. Yeah, Jeff Jarrett won. And there are, well, people see. Who, there are people who are like, Jeff Jarrett's had such a great year. Yeah, because he's <laughs> playing along with all the stupid shit, so people like the stupid shit like his stuff. His run in AEW is awful. Well, how, what, why is that giant there except to block the fucking sun on hot days? He does nothing and people still run roughshod over the group with him standing there like a fucking giant pinhead. Well, he took a guitar shot and he also gave Eddie a choke slam. And Jay Lethal was all over this. I mean, it was almost like Eddie versus Jay Lethal and Jeff the whole match. And then finally, Sanjay had to get involved. And the giant just randomly would appear and either take a guitar shot or deliver a choke slam with Karen just running around nonstop. This is TNA. You want to talk about the TNA revival? <laughs> this is TNA, right? This match was TNA personified. Hey, let me ask you a question. We'll move on. <laughs> if the giant here, giant uh, Zippy and Eddie Kingston were both working for the WWE and Zippy choke slammed Eddie Kingston. Would you ever see Eddie Kingston 
outside an iron lung ever again on television? You know, I don't, I, I, maybe in the past you could say no, but again, WWE TV nowadays with the feckless giants that even they've had. Well, I guess you're right. But Zippy's the most feckless of them all because he's been there a while now. Does he do anything? You're never getting anything out of him, it doesn't seem like. Where's the big India tour with Zippy as the main eventer? I don't know if they've got a, a compensated for making him the, the, the suits yet. Because you know he ain't buying those off the rack. Eddie should have gotten that big security guard in a funny suit from last week from the Christian Cage segment. I don't think it, that guy wasn't that big, though. He was ready it for was, action. It was Zippy's having his shit custom made by Omar the tent maker. This Jeff Jarrett stuff is so bad. Well, yeah. wait. So I know how you feel about it, and I'm sorry to have to agree with you. It's, it's like, it, again, another one of my, my children has disappointed me by turning to a life of crime. It's everyone trying to hang on. The only way they do it is to play along. They saw what Chris Jericho did. Chris Jericho got it right. That's the business model. If you're an older wrestler and you don't have much going on, and Jericho had stuff going on, but if you don't have stuff going on, latch on to the younger wrestlers, agree with everything they do, even if you don't, shut up, keep it to yourself, play along, do whatever they want. Tell Tony he's doing a great job. No matter what, even if he's not doing a great job, doesn't matter. He's a billionaire. Tell him he's doing a great job and that you just want to help. That's the fucking business model for too many older wrestlers now. Well, speaking of doing a great job, did Action Andretti do one for Miro? I wish you would have seen this. This was on mute. Uh, Cause I had the, uh, the Phillies game was pretty exciting. I have to say, and I'm a Mets fan, but Bryce Harper is a great player. And Schwarber is just hitting home runs. All, all right. All right. All right. This went way longer than it should have. This went through a commercial break. No. Yeah. It went a long time for this, you know, again, the weird tease of CJ, the hot and flexible, I guess she's, are they call her hot and flexible CJ. I forget how they do it, but she's certainly hot and flexible. In at least name, this thing went see, on a while. Seeing Hot J flexible. This went on a long time. This went on a long time. See, the problem with TNA now is AEW is taking the place of what TNA was, which is a place for people who left WWE to go and just do whatever the fuck they want. <laughs> well, but so he didn't just just squash one tackle pancake. Our no. friend Action Andretti. No, this went a while. Oh boy. Okay. Apparently, uh, but he still beat him. So what's the future with CJ hot and flexible and, and ac action at this point? Is he off the list? Well, action, you know, it's, I almost want you to go back and watch this match if you have it on oh, DVR. Jesus. It's fascinating because action does all the things that people pop for, but they kind of just sit there and watch him do it because they're not invested in him at all. So it's kind of like, what was his name of um, Vince Young? Yes. Remember Vince Young? Yes. He showed up in the WWF. Forget what name. They, they changed his name to something else. In the WWF in 89, working like the opening match on show. Oh, so God it would be on TV. Yeah. And he would do things that you think people would get into, like flips and... Break dancing. Well, he didn't really do the break dancing. The WWE was smart enough to say, don't do that. But he did lots of flips and stuff, but no one cared. No one cared at all. And I kind of feel like that was the same thing here. No one was really caring about action and Andretti. They care about whatever this Miro CJ stuff is because they want to see it go somewhere, but they don't care about action and Andretti. He got out of the camel clutch and then eventually Miro beat him with the camel clutch. But before oh, Miro God. left the ring, Miro exchanged a look with him, almost like a sign of respect. You lasted past the commercial break. I respect you. Oh, geez. All right. Um, so apparently... Now they've got FTR wrestling Bad Bad Brown and Darian Bingston. And the match starts and the lights go out. And then they come back on and Malachi Black is in the ring. And then the lights go out again. And then they come back on and the rest of the House of Black is there and they beat up FTR. So now we have to apparently suffer through FTR being sucked into the vortex of whatever the spooky ass House of Dark Shadows bullshit that Malachi Black wants to do to express his fucking art. 
is is involving here. Malachi has dropped the face paint. This is the way we get House of Black versus FTR and Edge. Also, of course, set up earlier, House of Black versus Blackpool Combat Club. The AEW booking is horrible. It's not just the comedy segments. The entirety of the show is booked horribly. And nothing's going to change. Well, but the, the lights, the, again, the lights went out two different sets of times in this segment on top of the other previous segments. It's bad. I mean, even Heyman didn't do that. Even <laughs> Heyman. Look at the state of him in the mid 90s. Even he didn't do that. Well, the, the, the lights, the lights go up, the lights go down, the lights go in and all around. You know, these things happen. And next, now they're going to have somebody now, a new wrestler, come onto the roster, and their gimmick is going to be whenever they appear, the fucking cable goes out. You just get a screen that says to pay your bill, call 1-800. Anyway, the main event of this thing was the AEW Tag Team Champions Ricky Starks and Big Bill, who, again... We're not even a tag team until six weeks ago and should be the Shawn Michaels and Diesel of this journey through hysteria. But they faced Claudio Castagnoli and Wheeler Useless and apparently defeated them to retain the tag team championship in what looks like a long and involved process to me. And then the House of Black come and beat them up oh did they see i didn't even watch the end of the show did they come out again oh yeah it says uh hold on here did the lights go out hold on sun goes down on a sleepy town um it says house of black shows to attack as malachi black distack distacks the distracts the referee the stacks well i'm trying to see I'm trying to read without my glasses on and my tongue got lopped over my eye teeth and I couldn't see what I was saying. So when Black distracted the referee, Starks hit a spear and a Rochambeau for the pin and the win. And so Starks and Big Bill, they won the match and then the House of Black beat up Useless and then Brian Danielson charged to the ring, but they beat him up and then FTR came down and then Starks and Big Bill got involved. And then here came John Moxley. John Moxley? Where the fuck was he? I, I don't fucking know. Well, he was out in the parking lot. This guy got jumped earlier in the show. Where was he? And uh, then Ricky Starks apparently got hit with a big rig, and Claudio did the big swing. And, uh, oh, and they did a jump rope spot where Claudio was big swinging Starks and Cash was doing a jump rope spot with it. How many people were in the ring? How'd they do that? Probably about 47. <laughs> Boy, I really missed a lot of stuff apparently in the last few minutes of this. Well, uh, see, part. you never, you can't take your eyes off it for a second. But that wasn't all, you know. That was not all because then we had the Battle of the Belts, right? Should baby faces be armed with flashlights in <laughs> AEW going to the ring? After this many instances of the lights going out and surprise, it's a sneak attack or the devil doing a video saying nothing in a mask. Should baby faces bring flashlights to the ring? That way you'd always be protected. You know, God dang it. I actually had little Cornette's Collectibles keychain flashlights a couple of seasons ago. And if I had still had those now, this would be a wonderful marketing idea. But yeah, I think either that or just everybody get an outfit like Jeff Jarrett used to have in the WWF that would light up on its own. <laughs> and that way, when they turn the lights out, you just hit the button on your trunks and your trunks and your knee pads and your boots and maybe your elbow pads. They all light up with spotlights. I know laser pointers are banned, and for good reason. Are flashlights banned? No, as a matter of fact, I think the fans ought to start bringing flashlights because it, yeah. you want to be sitting in one of these big city sports arenas, even if there's not a lot of people in them, and, and all of a sudden the lights go out and it's pitch black and you don't know who these people are sitting next to you. How many pockets do you think are getting picked? There it is. If I'm in the House of Black, I'm going to a different town every week. I'm working with the local pickpockets. Hey, I promise you the lights, psst, the lights are going out at 8.30. Yeah, 
Meet me after eight, the show in the in the back. 857. You got 90 seconds. Make it good. We'll split it up at the usual place. If you need more time, we'll get Julia out here to distract everyone. <laughs> oh, man, that guy, you can take all the time you want then. Send old Julia out there. <laughs> See, I like our booking of the House of Black better, where they're not really spooky people. They use this to steal people's money. <laughs> it's part of a plot. They're really thieves in the night. <laughs> this is like the plot of the Unholy Three with Lon Chaney Sr., uh, but anyway, and, uh, but real quick, I know you didn't watch this, but they actually got, as a gift to them, another hour of national cable television time after what we have just described that they presented, the Battle of the Belts. And if you want to know what they, real quickly, what they presented to the unsuspecting public, Brian? I had an idea of uh, some of the stuff, but I'd like to hear. I don't know the results. And by the way, I apologize for any noise in the background. The oh, wind. God. It's a heavy wind, a mighty wind here today. Oh, it's a heavy wind. It's beating the windows with sledgehammers. It's so heavy. I thought it was my tinnitus. It was really just the wind. Maybe it's your analitis. Analitis? Yeah, because you're so anal about your fucking audio there. Ah, maybe. So they presented the AEW International Champion, our little puppy Pockets, against Long John Silver of the Dork Order. And of course, we know who won that. Uh, the mascot prevailed. And then they gave Samoa Joe apparently a one minute or less uh, squash match with Tony Nese in defense of the Ring of Honor TV title. I'm not opposed to giving Joe all of the wins that they can. Uh, but again, on a, it's a squash TV match on what's supposed to be a special, a, a quarterly or six times a year or whatever. Chris Stadlander retained the TBS title over Willow Nightingale. And apparently, the acclaimed with Billy Gunn or and Billy Gunn with the Memphis Grizzlies mascot beat up the former Jericho appreciators with uh, a couple more of them in the corner because they're still a group even though there's no reason for them to be together because they don't appreciate Jericho anymore. And uh, that was the one-hour television special. That was the one hour to drive people off the network is what that was. Oof. Yeah, I didn't watch any of that, nor will I. But, I mean, at this, why are they doing this? If this is what he can come up with that he thinks is going to attract viewers for a, a special one-hour primetime television program that they were given as a consolation prize for having to move networks. And now it's just meaningless matches with nobodies for the most part. Well, that was Battle of the Belts 8. Ah, and you know what? At that point, if I had been watching, I guarantee you at that point of the night, Brian, I would have been ready for a good night's sleep. Who wouldn't? Well, I'll tell you one thing. There is no better way to get one. What's the transition here? No better no, way what? to get a good night's sleep. <laughs> no better way to get one. <laughs> there's, there's no better way to get some than to be on a Helix sleep mattress. That's it. Because Why didn't we think of this before? Because not only, we've been talking about the good night's sleep that you can get with a Helix sleep mattress. We've been talking about for months and months and months now about the fine different models that they have for the big and tall sleepers, the mattresses for kids, the Helix Elite Collection, the award-winning Lux Collection. They'll heat you up. They'll cool you down. They will do all these things, but we talk about it like you're going to be on this thing alone. Why don't we talk about the incredible array of mattresses that they also have for bedroom Olympics? I mean, you get these mattresses. The mattress for the big and tall sleepers, obviously, is going to be able to support more than the average human being. So if there's two of you doing the flip, flop, and fly and you get some air on that last one, and you bounce down on the mattress, Brian, you don't want to break one of these normal store-bought mattresses, but these big and tall sleeper mattresses, they will stand up to some punishment. Let's say you're doing the horizontal bop, 
with a mango twist at the end, reverse cowgirl style, and you know that that's just going to wear the springs out of most ordinary mattresses, but not a Helix Sleep mattress because they are built by award-winning professionals from the United States of America where they know how to build up mattresses that'll stand up to a good fucking. So again, a good, folks, And of course, don't forget, beyond the uh, perverted mind of Jim Cornette, sleep. Lots of people like to sleep on these mattresses. Lots and of they people are, like, to, like to sleep after they bump uglies on a beautiful Helix Sleep mattress. Beautiful, that's right. That is the word. Beautiful mattresses. Of course, they come firm. They come soft. They come prepared for you. That's you take what a sleep that's survey. What they, that's the people sleeping on the Helix sleep mattresses. They come firm. They come. Soft. I'm talking about the mattress itself. Of course, and they here's have another firm thing. Mattress. Do they do they have a style of mattress where you can roll off to the side and retch and vomit before you go to sleep? One of those little grooves right in the middle, so you won't go head first to the floor. That's for folks who like to engage in the occasional sociable cocktail out and about in the evenings. But nevertheless, folks, whatever you're going to be what? doing on these mattresses, like the sleep. folks at Helix, like sleep, they, sleep, they, you can do that too. You can you can conk right out right after you've flogged the bishop, whatever the case may be. But all you got to do, folks, right now is go to Helix. That's H E L I X HelixSleep.com, and you take the two minute quiz on what kind of positions you like to sleep in or what kind of positions you like to do what kind of positions you like to sleep in how you like to sleep how you like your mattress do you like yes firmness do you like softness do you like heat do you like throbbing hard however you like your mattress for a good night's sleep a spectacular splendid night of sleep you can get it from helix sleep we love them here for the record i should probably disclose this we have a few different Healy Sleep mattresses here in the house. The kids love them. We love them. And I got their beautiful all-form couch in the library. That is my nap couch of choice. Helix makes good stuff. Can you have perverted and non-monogamous relationships on the couch, too? What? Well, nevertheless, folks, you go to helixsleep.com, you take the quiz, you pick out the mattress you want, and they're going to deliver this bad boy right to you. Right then, you can put it into your bedroom. You can put it anywhere you want. The living room, the dungeon, maybe even in the bathtub. Bedroom. It certainly makes taking a bath a little softer. Bedroom sounds like the best bet. And of course, everyone needs a good bed in their bedroom. And there's no finer bed you can get today and watch inflate in front of you than Helix Sleep's fine Helix Sleep mattress. That's right. And 97% of the people polled indicated that they had a bed in their bedroom. So, folks, right now, if you go to helixsleep.com slash JCE, they're offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners right now. And they're just, they're holding these pillows right now. They're waiting to shove them right in your face and just love on you with them. They'll just hold them right over your face. Right, I no. tell you, they'll mash down. No metaphorically speaking until you take them metaphorically speaking maybe but in terms of physicality and the physical world <laughs> there will be no pillows held over your face there'll be fine pillows under your head while you sleep on your fine well, helix sleep mattresses will be under your bum and have a good night's <laughs> sleep with well, helix if you want to sleep with a bum on a mattress go to helixsleep.com slash jce 20 percent off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners you can't beat that with a stick brian no you can't nor should you but you should get a good night's sleep with helix sleep a fine mattress what's the promo code one more time jim helixsleep.com slash jce you mean you can't beat these things with a stick anymore you can get a good night's sleep that will be splendid and spectacular. All right, Brian. Well, a lot of our, our listeners, the cult of Cornette, the people out there, they love the classic wrestling segments. They love the, the wrestling history, the insight that we give. And honestly, we have more fun talking about that than we do this modern stuff. So this week, I wanted to do something because normally we're talking about some classic wrestling that I may have actually been involved in because that's I'm experienced in that. I can speak firsthand. So I wanted to figure out something that I was interested in knowing more about that maybe I've, I've read the books in the past or I've, you know, gone over the records, but specifically for this subject, 
I wanted to do something I was interested in, so I went back and did a little research. And I would like to ask you a question. You are, as the people know, a wrestling savant. I would say no, that... Oh, no. Well, no, no, you're, you're humble for once? I'm just your silly little friend. I don't know anything. You're just a small town wrestling savant. Nothing to, you know, write home to the big city about. But you may not be able to answer this question, or you might, but I would, I would bet, I would wager, I'd go to DraftKings, that 99.9% of the people out there are probably not going to be able to answer this question. I will pose it to you out loud. Who, Brian Last is the biggest heel box office attraction in the history of professional wrestling in Nashville, Tennessee. In Nashville, Tennessee. I thought you were going with, you know, ever. I was going to say the Sheik, but I think enough people know that by now. Although he did wrestle in Nashville, I don't think he was the top draw there as a heel. Jackie Fargo was the top babyface star. Len Rossi was a big babyface star. And it's a singles wrestler as a heel? Sing singles wrestler, singles heel box office attraction in the history of Nashville. Lawler did not wrestle in Nashville that often after a certain point, but he also was babyface after that point. He, he did wrestle quite a bit in the early 70s there when he was a heel with Sam Bass. Right. Just, you know, just to clarify. But I don't think he would be on this list is what I'm, uh, what no. I'm presuming at the moment. And it's a singles wrestler, so that takes out the interns and Saul Weingroff and uh, the Von Brauners or anything else. Tojo Yamamoto? No. I give up. You And you didn't even mention that the Welch brothers were always baby faces, so it couldn't That's even the have been them. It's all baby faces. Tojo eventually turns baby face. He was there as a heel for a while, and that gave him the ability to stay there forever, but... I guess the problem is I'm trying to think of heels that stayed there a period of time because I almost think like that's a prerequisite, but yep. you know, people came in and out a lot. Eh? Sputnik, you know, everyone thinks nope. Sputnik, it's Memphis in 59. Yep. It's not really the rest of the Goulas Welch territory. The it, name that I am going to give you was a, I would say not only the, the biggest heel box office attraction, but was comparable in their heyday, to the money that Jackie Fargo drew uh, over a 10-year period from the early 60s to the early 70s, and would probably place only behind Jerry Lawler as a babyface and maybe Herb Welch as a draw period. What years? 1940 to 19, wait a minute, hold on, to 1948 with a, a reprise, um, no, I'm sorry, 1949. It no, can't be, 48, 48, 48. It can't be Bill Longson. No. <laughs> Who is it? Pat Malone. Oh, the Green Shadow. The Green Shadow. And the reason I brought this up is I, be, I was thinking I used to do a column every month for Fighting Spirit magazine back when it was publishing. I didn't run it out of business. I did everything I could. But I would do historical pieces, and I'd been thinking about doing one about Pat Malone, the Green Shadow. And then when I thought about this topic, I went to the wonderful book that Scott Teal has published over at crowbarpress.com. My, my friend Mark James covers the Memphis end at markjamesbooks.com, but Scott has done a wonderful job chronicling the, the more Nashville-centric and Goulas area promotions. And he did a history of wrestling in Nashville up to 1960. And you can go back and look. I mean, it was a very complicated time in the 30s and 40s when the Goulas Welch booking office in Nashville got formed. And during the 1930s, there were two different wrestling promotions in Nashville. One guy was promoting heavyweight wrestling, which was not as popular as the light heavyweights. And in those days, that was guys 180 pounds, 190 pounds, whatever, which Roy Welch and the Welch brothers and Pat Malone and 
a lot of these other guys fit into. They were legitimate shooters, raw bones, you know, lean, hard country boys, but they weren't the the big 300 pound guys of the the major circuits, and they concentrated on personal issues and feuds and heat, and that's why that that Tennessee became and through the 80s known for a territory that like smaller guys with more action. Notice I didn't say gymnastics, but action. And well, the main title was a Southern, Southern event- Junior Heavyweight title. Yeah, and eventually that became the Southern Heavyweight Championship. But actually, and that title wasn't even instituted until the early 50s. In the late 30s, when Roy Welch was first taking over Nashville, by being a wrestler with enough pull to have a group of guys that he could book and strong arm in his way through the thing, he was billed as the light heavyweight champion. And then they would do a world light heavyweight championship and they would have world junior heavyweight title matches and they were big deals. But nevertheless, Roy Welch and Pat Malone uh, had a friendship and a long running relationship. And you can tell by how Pat Malone was used and which cities he was most successful in were the ones that Roy had the most control over for the long period of time. But, for example, he, the Green Shadow in Louisville lasted three or four months, and they unmasked him. But the Green Shadow in Nashville lasted eight years. And on and off now, not every single week. And in those days, if you got unmasked 100 miles away from here, there wasn't even television. A lot of people didn't have radios, for fuck's sake, right? You you know, unless you were buying out-of-town newspapers from Bowling Green, you didn't know what the fuck happened. But nevertheless, Roy Welch sets up his booking office in Nashville. He's the boss. He's the booker of the talent. And Nick Goulas becomes his front man because Roy was still active and didn't want people to know he was the promoter. And Chris Jordan, the the promoter in Birmingham that Nick had been working for, had just died. Nick moves to Nashville and becomes Roy's partner, and eventually they take back over Birmingham. And Eddie Malone had worked in Nashville as early as 1937. But here's the thing. the re- uh, When I knew Pat Malone, and we've talked about him as far as the wrestling news and the pictures when he was selling the magazines and guarding the locker room door, right? When I was a 15-year-old kid, and Scott Teal says the same thing in, in his book. He rode with Pat Malone in the car, didn't know the questions to ask him. I, it was the same way. When I first started being allowed access to the back of the Louisville Gardens to take pictures, I still wasn't going in the locker room. It was just a backstage area that wasn't public. And right through that door, before the locker rooms that were downstairs, would sit Pat Malone. And he guarded the locker room door. And from the start, I I found it kind of funny that this, this old man comes all the way from Nashville just to sit there and make sure nobody goes in the locker room, right? But also from Christine Jarrett to all the boys, Lawler on down, everybody always put him over. And they're always, hey, Lawler called him pie face because he got that from Jackie Fargo. Because at the time, Pat Malone, he was, I don't know how old he was, because his wife, Sammy, who was one of Christine Jarrett's drivers, she had told me one time that he was born in 1900, which would have made him in his late 70s at this point. When he was arrested one time back in the 40s, it made the paper and he gave his birth date as 1910. So maybe he's almost 70. But then on online, when he died in 1988, his obituary, they gave the uh, the ages 88. So I don't know how old this fucking guy was. But he sits there, he's got the rumpled old jacket on and that old kind of Groucho Marx mustache, but not painted on. And his face, his head was round. He had become a fleshy old gentleman. And he had a pie face and he always wore this beat up old hat that businessmen used to wear in the 50s, right? You'd see in the newsreels. And it was probably that old. 
And that was his thing. He guarded the locker room. And like I said, everybody put him over. A lot of the guys, hey, see, he was a shooter. Or Christine would actually say, you know, he was the biggest draw that we ever had in Nashville. And to me, I'm thinking I couldn't process. This was before wrestling magazines. This was before television. Nobody was giving me any specifics. And I couldn't picture how this lumpy old guy that would would laugh with Lawler and Dundee and some of the boys, how the fuck was he the biggest box office attraction in the history of anything, right? And at the time, he had one old guy come came over from Frankfurt, I think it was, somewhere around Frankfurt, that had been his friend and come to see him wrestle in the 40s at at the the Jefferson County Armory that became the Gardens. And this guy, his name was Ira Fortner. I'll never forget it. And they would just sit in the back and slap each other's knee and tell old bullshit stories. And I didn't know to listen because I didn't know what the fuck I was missing out on. This was, you know, incomprehensible to me, right? But anyway, that's the thing. So a couple Pat Malone stories, and I'm going to tell you about the Green Shadow. Because everybody talked about Pat sometimes not right in front of him, depending on the subject, but his wife, Sammy, who had to be, I love this woman, but she looked like Peg Bundy. Did you ever even see a picture of Sammy Malone? Was no. there any of the wrestling news files? I, I have to go back and check. I'm not sure, but I know Peg Bundy, of course. Well, because it, 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 everybody knows Teeny Jarrett never drove a car, and she would always have somebody drive her to her towns. And when we first started going, it was Petey Welch, who was Roy Welch's wife. And then I say about the time that Roy passed away, which I believe was in early 1977, either shortly before or after that, um, she made the change and Pat's wife, Sammy, started. And it, had, it was Pat's second marriage, at least. And Sammy was a very voluptuous woman. And she had a great sense of humor. And she was diametrically opposite to the kind of more reserved and prim Christine Jarrett, I'd love to have been a fly on the wall in the car, but she, yeah, she looked like Peg Bundy and, and my mom loved her too. She was great, but she would tell stories about Pat because Pat would ride up like with the referee, Paul Morton, or if Dundee was booking, he always got there earlier. He was riding with the boys and Sammy was driving teeny. So we go out to dinner afterwards and she would tell the stories, and it's uh, until I started looking at the research that Scott did and the newspaper articles and et cetera from Nashville, that, okay, there's wrestler's exaggeration. Pat Malone, as the green shadow, had so much heat, he carried a knife in his fucking boot. Not for potential double crosses in the ring, but for the fans that were hitting the fucking ring to kill him. And he it was a Barlow knife, because he'd always say, ah, I pulled out old Barlow. This one guy hit the ring one time and stabbed him. And Pat chased the guy out of the fucking building and caught him in the parking lot. And when they pulled Pat off of him, he was on top of the guy with his knife out, trying to cut the guy's head off by sawing from left to right. And, I'm like, and, and Sammy's laughing at it. Yeah, that's Pat. And so... <laughs> I remember, I don't know whether this guy is 80 yet or not. In 1978, he's either 68 or 78. But like I've said, five foot eight and lumpy. But they had cleared the building one night, and all the fans had gone out front. And of course, a lot of fans usually went around back and waited to see the guys come out, whatever. But I'm up at the merchandise table. They're counting the pictures. They're folding everything up. I'm going to go back and tear down my photography equipment. And as I get to almost to the back entrance of the backstage area I talked about, Brian, there was an accordion door, one of those metal doors that would, on a track at the top, but not at the bottom, and you could close it like a curtain or open it, but it's made out of metal. Yeah. Those okay. old-time arena doors. And you could, you could close off another room that way. Well, that thing was closed, but as I start, I get about 20 feet away from it, I hear, BAM! And the bottom of that thing that's not on a track bows out, and here comes a fucking human body rolling under the fucking thing. And I'm like, what the fuck? And there Pat Malone throws that door back, and he's got his one hand throwing the door open and the other hand reaching in his pocket, and he's like, get up, you son of a bitch. <laughs> what the fuck? 
Apparently, some guy had beat on the back door. Pat may have thought it was one of the boys forgot his bag or whatever, opened it, and the guy pushed his way by, said he needed to see Jerry Lawler, whoever the fuck it was. And Pat threw that motherfucker into that door. He didn't stop till he rolled and hit the opposite wall. And as he's getting up, he's like, no, no. And Pat's digging in his pocket. I'm like, what do I do? I'm not going to help the other guy. But I, I don't know whether, you know, I should talk to Pat at this point. Or I have say, yeah, Sammy, <laughs> Mr. Malone's having a fight. And there was still a cop in the building. They were out in the lobby, but there was one still in there, and they come running. Sammy got there first and kept him from pulling anything out of his pocket. And then the cop got there and corralled this guy and saved his life. And this guy's... So, apparently what they bonded over, Roy Welch and Pat Malone, whose real name was Eddie Edgar Davies. And that was another thing. He was in the hospital one time when he quit traveling and Christine got upset because she went to visit him and she actually accidentally said Pat Malone and oh I'm sorry Eddie Davies and the, she said the nurse looked at her like why has he got two different names well it's a professional name she was very protective of shit like that but his name was Eddie Davies he worked as Eddie Malone he worked as Pat O'Brien um he worked as Pat Malone Apparently, he and Roy bonded over Ginger the bear. They both trained bears. At various points, Roy Welch had a bear named Ginger, and later in uh, later years, Pat had two or three Gingers. And they would take, when, when the Green Shadows run was over somewhere or needed a break, he would go out with the bear and take the bear on tour. Or once Roy sent him down to Florida to be a booker, when Roy and Nick were opening up part of Florida. So he and Roy Welch were together from the late 30s until, well, pretty much the end of Roy's life when he got out of the wrestling business, and Pat was still involved because of Jerry Jarrett. And the he was like a, one of the Vince guys, right? You always got to take care of Gorilla or this guy or that guy. Pat was the guy in in the Tennessee territory because of what he had meant and how instrumental he was to their business. So would you like to go over a couple of his, the green shadows exploits in Nashville, Tennessee? Yeah, let's do that. And for the record, I first found out a lot about his career as the green shadow from John Cosper's book on Louisville wrestling. And like you said, it's a much shorter period of time, but it gave me an idea of just how big a star he was in the South. Well, and, and that's the thing is, again, because Louisville had a separate promoter, and at various points, they'd get people from the Nashville booking office from St. Louis, so they didn't run with... they uh, The masked wrestler had already been established in Louisville with uh, Bill Longson and Hans Schnabel as the masked Superman 1 and 2, and Green Shadow didn't get a big run. But where Roy controlled everything, he knew how to get heat, and he knew how to get people over. But speaking of heat... um. Let me set it up for you. In the late 30s, Roy Welch was the light heavyweight champion, as I said. Eddie Malone was making a handful of appearances for the light heavyweight group. And then there was a period of time where the light heavyweight promoter was out of business and out of Nashville. Although in May 1938, they were broadcasting the matches on Tuesday nights at 9.30 p.m. on WSIX radio. So they had radio wrestling in the 30s in Nashville. And anyway, they finally got their shit together to take over Nashville in the summer of 1939. That's when Roy got the old-time promoter back briefly, and then Nick took over from there. And at that point, by the way, Roy and Herb Welch had the first tag team match ever in the history of Nashville on July 18th, 1940. And then the Green Shadow debuts, October 1st, 1940. And the arena in Nashville in those days, there was no sports arena per se. It was the Nashville Hippodrome, which was a roller rink. And Brian, I get... Do the kids know that back in the 30s and 40s, the Depression days, and et cetera, that a thing that people did constantly every week was to go out and go roller skating? 
it was still pretty big into well, it was still big ish until the 80s. I had my birthday party at Hot Skates in nineteen. Well, yeah, but uh, I mean, not even kids, but I mean, adults, everybody. That was the thing. Is you went roller skate. They even had roller skating marathons in the Depression. Point is, as crazy as it sounds, it was the pretty much the most popular arena in Nashville, and they had country music acts, and they had wrestling, and they had all kinds of shit, was the Nashville Hippodrome roller skating rink. And they had a big open floor, the oval track, and they had bleachers that seated, we don't know how many. Even Scott's not able to tell for sure because of the, the fact that it was expandable and combustible seating, right? Not only the, the hard bleachers you can see from photographs of the time, but you could get a ton of seats on the floor or you could also have standing room. And then there was the proclivity for the wrestling promoters to exaggerate their crowds, right? So they've announced record crowds at 2,500 people, 3,000 people, and 4,000 people. The best you can tell from pictures, from newspaper accounts, and from people shitting on Nick's attendance figures and saying it only holds so many, you could probably get about 3,000 people in the Hippodrome for wrestling if you jammed them and they were standing. And that's probably what happened most of the time because, again, Teeny sold tickets there. Jerry Jarrett sold programs there. They used to talk about, she would say, oh, you should have seen the way we used to cram them into the Hippodrome. And they'd tell stories about Nick Goulas was so, whereas Roy never went out in front of the people and never was on television. Nick was all over TV, and he was out there at the front at the box office on those sellouts cussing the people to get them in. Go on now. Go on in there. God damn it, boy. Move, move. We got to get you in. He was the exact opposite, right? So they launched the Green Shadow in the Hippodrome in Nashville, Tennessee, with their weekly Tuesday night shows. There's no television because there is no fucking television. It's 1940. And the way that the wrestling promoters and the, that the matches are publicized is they not only put ads in the paper, but they have stories in the paper. The wrestling promoter would always go to the local newspaper and try to get in in those days with somebody that wrote for the paper, the sports section. And when something was that popular in a town, usually they'd give it some coverage. And especially down south and through the Midwest, it, in 1940, all the newspapers weren't shitting on wrestling yet because they knew a lot of people went every week. And remember Nashville in 1940, the, the Grand Old Opry, the Ryman Auditorium was there, the radio program was on, but it, for most of the people in the country, that that hillbilly music they play on that radio station from Nashville, that's that's some different stuff. It was new. Nashville wasn't the country music capital of the world because country music wasn't big enough to have a capital yet. They had no professional sports, and it wasn't a major tourist attraction. So they were drawing just regular people from Nashville, Tennessee, that lived there. And the first thing that they do is put him over every week. And back in those days, if a masked wrestler lost a match ever, he was supposed to take his mask off. And so they never let the Green Shadow lose. In December, he's beaten Roy Welch two out of three falls, and the newspaper says, standing room only, 2,500 people. And December 31st, he beats him again. And again, in those days, there were only three matches on the card, and a lot of these matches, all of them were two out of three falls. Some of them had 90-minute or two-hour time limits. And when you think about it, 2,500 people, the average ticket was probably 75 cents in those days. So if they drew $2,000, then that's it, times 19 for 2023 money, that's the equivalent of a $38,000 house. And they're splitting 30% of that money amongst the six guys and a referee, and the main event is getting the majority of the 30%. So if you could get out of that $2,000 house, if the main event got a $200 payoff, that's like $3,800 fucking dollars. 
And these guys were turning these people away from the Hippodrome. And on February 25th, that's when he was first arrested for beating up a fan. And that's where he gave his name of Edgar B. Davies. He had to, but still nobody had seen his face. And they didn't know that Ed Davies was Eddie Malone. And by April, he was still undefeated. They did a sellout of 3,000 against the Irish Angel and 2,500 against Carlos Rodriguez. And you would see that every few weeks, they'd leave him off a card or two. Or every couple of months, he'd be off a month or so and come back. And then, again, going into World War II, the shows are drawing according to newspaper reports and columns, not just, you know, the wrestler promoter hyperbole. They're doing two to 3,000 people a week. And he's in the main event everywhere. And you don't know the Tarzan Jordan he beat, Soldier Thomas, Flash Clifford. But they're fucking selling out this place and they're turning them away. And uh, then... At one point on December 9th, when he was disqualified in the third fall in front of another 3,000-plus crowd, the fans tried to batter down the locker room door. And then on February 3rd, 1942, he was arrested again for punching a fan. In uh, June, they he went to a draw for the World Junior Heavyweight title with Gus Johnson. You remember him, Brian. Gus Johnson, no. That's the thing. Nick and Roy would make up titles to give people that it would come in and defend them against the local hot star. And nobody knew. But they went to a 90-minute draw with one fall apiece. And at this point, Roy Welch had assembled his base crew that they always drew money with in Nashville and Chattanooga and Birmingham. Roy Welch, Herb Welch, The Green Shadow, Rowdy Red Roberts, Wild Bill Caney, Tex Riley. And then there was a newspaper clipping that in August 1942, the state of wrestling in Tennessee, Chattanooga was drawn up to 6,000 a week because they had that old memorial auditorium. Knoxville was doing around 2,000 at the Lyric Theater. They ended up having to leave the Lyric Theater, as we've talked about in the past, because it wasn't big enough to hold the crowds. Memphis was doing, according to this, three to 4,000 a week at the Ellis Auditorium. And Nashville, as they mentioned, was turning people away from the Hippodrome. And again, in August, a fan slashed the green shadow across the face with a broken bottle when he was facing Johnson again for the junior heavyweight title in October. And I'm not even mentioning all the standing room only and the sellouts and everything in October, another Gus Johnson match, a bottle was thrown from the crowd that gashed the shadows head open and a riot broke out that involved, according to the newspaper, several hundred fans. And they can, they had more Gus Johnson goddamn matches, but he never beat the Green Shadow unless it was by disqualification. In February 1943, somebody threw a salt shaker into the ring and cut the Green Shadow's head open, and he used it to bloody both of the baby faces and was disqualified, started another riot. In, in 1943, he was in almost every main event. And again, think about this. If they're drawing 2,000 people a week, that's 100,000 people a year. And again, if the average ticket was 75 cents in those days, that's $75,000. What is 75,000 times 19, Brian? I don't know, Jim. What is it? Well, I don't have a calculator in front of me. You know how to work it on your computer? Uh, well, you got to give me a heads up. You can't just throw that How about, shit at okay, 75,000 times 10 is 750,000. What are you asking times me? 750. Wait, wait a minute. God damn it. Now you got me thrown off. Yeah. If they were even selling 2,000 tickets a week, that's 100,000 a year. If the tickets were 75 cents, that's $75,000 times 19 to take up for the inflation of today. That would be a $1.5 million they're drawing in a goddamn roller rink with this guy with a green fucking sock on his head. That's the kind of heat this motherfucker had. 1425000 to be precise, but maybe you well, need there a calculator. You go. 
And then in March 1944, Roy Welch, it was announced in the papers, and we've talked about this before, he tried to open up Florida. This was before Cowboy Luttrell. And he took Pat as a matchmaker, and they stayed down there for three months while they would come back up and still wrestle most weeks in Nashville. And in a couple of years, uh, Roy tried to install Nick down there in Tampa as the promoter, and he stayed for a while, but they couldn't, the only promotion they couldn't really open up and get a foothold in was Florida. And it was till what, the the 60s when Lester Welch finally got a piece that they really had any longevity, the Welch family in Florida. But anyway, listen to this one. September 26, 1944. Otto Ludwig beat Roy Welch and then came out to second the Green Shadow against Chief Saunook. And they had a riot, and Ludwig was arrested for assault with intent to murder a policeman. Whoa. With a stick. Apparently, he took the cop's nightstick away. They had a standing room only crowd, and they were back the following week with a tag team match, Herb and Roy against. Green Shadow and Otto, and they sold out again. And then, for whatever reason, in 19 March of 45, they announced that a random match with a nobody was Green Shadow's last match in Nashville. And everybody went thinking, well, they'll finally beat him, he'll unmask. He won and just left for a year. And that was apparently, again, the time that Roy was sending people down to Florida because when Nick started in 1946 running Tampa, the main event was the Green Shadow over the Crimson Terror. And then he, uh, a couple matches in 46, he did some stuff with Ginger the Bear. Green Shadow returns again in Nashville in 48. Main event versus Tex Riley, standing room only. He starts winning the main event every week again. And then found May 25th, he beat Herb Welch two out of three falls. And several fans got arrested for attacking him. And then finally, the following week, they did a screwy deal where the Green Shadow was unmasked even though he won. He beat Herb Welch two out of three falls in front of a standing room only crowd to win the junior heavyweight title. But in the process of that, Herb Welch unmasked him, and they revealed his name was Pat O'Brien. And then he worked a few more weeks in main events, did a few more sellouts, and dropped the junior heavyweight title to Herb and left again. And then he was back a spot here and there after that in Nashville. He even lost to Ginger the Bear that was his his bear because Pat O'Brien could do, do jobs and still main event and get heat, but the Green Shadow was never allowed to lose. And then finally, somehow they turned him babyface. By the end of 1949, he lost a hair match to the Black Phantom, and it, this is where this finish comes from, Brian. I didn't know until I did this, this research that it ever worked. You know how every time that a babyface is booked to lose their fucking hair, the promoter thinks that the fans will say, no, no, he got screwed. Don't cut his hair. Yeah, I know a promoter actually who thought that. Yeah. Well, I learned it from fucking Tennessee, and I didn't learn what they learned. But guess what? They actually did it. He lost a hair match, but the fans threatened to riot if they cut his hair. Wow. And, and they wow. wouldn't do it. Oh, wow. And then the following re the following week, they had a rematch. They did standing room only again, and he got his head shaved and left the territory. And he was the Southern heavyweight champion in Tampa in 1950 as the Green Hornet. He was either 40 or 50 years old at that point. And then, by the way, more Nashville. This was now the Green Shadow run was over. But on May 15th, 1951. In a World Junior Heavyweight title match, Vern Gagne beat Pat O'Brien, two straight falls. And on December 4th, 1951, Pat O'Brien returned, lost by disqualification, and got arrested for getting in a fight with a fan. He was Southern Tag Team Champion with Carl Kowalski. He was Southern Tag Team Champion with 
Rowdy Red Roberts. Yeah, May 18th, 1953, he's in his mid-40s or 50s. I don't know. In Murfreesboro, Tennessee, he beats Dick Lever, who was a longtime outlaw guy in the, in the territory, and in the process makes the paper because he hit a fan, a member of the VFW, and a 350-pound deputy sheriff from Murfreesboro <laughs> and went to jail for that. The trifecta. On June 9th, 1953, Eddie Gossett beat Pat O'Brien by disqualification. So we, <laughs> the future Eddie Graham, who was a Tennessee boy, is on the way up when Pat was on the way down. And two weeks in a row in September, Freddie Blassie beat Pat O'Brien two out of three falls. And then his last appearance that I could see that uh, I think was on record in, as far as in the ring in Nashville, there was a Christmas time show to benefit needy families in 1958, and he came back and put Tex Riley over. And the main event was the Fargos against Corsica Joe and Corsica Jean. They drew 6,000 people at the the big auditorium they had down, downtown now. But statistics, real quick, and if you got any questions. His first appearance in Nashville as the Green Shadow was October 1st, 1940. And he was unmasked by Herb Welch on June 1st, 1948. In that period of time, he had 157 matches in Nashville, 102 were main events, and 44 were sellouts. And as Pat O'Brien in 1949, he had three more main events and three more sellouts. That is why that all those people used to tell me when I was a kid that that Lumpy, pie-faced old man was the biggest heel that the fucking business had ever seen. And I had no way to have the appreciation of it. What do you got? Well, I don't have too much. You kind of answered a lot of my questions. A fascinating look. You know, I almost wish there was a book. Uh, years ago, Nick Tosh's put out a book, The Unsung Heroes of Rock and Roll. There should be one of those about wrestling. Not just like the last 20 years, but... People who were interesting, who did interesting things that most fans would never hear of. And why would they? Yeah. Because there's no, first of all, there's no footage, at least that I know of. You're talking about... There's like three pictures in existence of the Green Shadow. A couple of pictures they used to use in the newspaper ads, and that's it. Yeah, so I mean, segments like I this... Got, I got an autographed picture of Pat Malone one time, but it was Eddie Malone, and it was from the 1930s, one of those cool old shots, and boy, he was a lean, mean bastard in those days, but he had no pictures of the Green Horn, or the Green Shadow. Hey, listen, if someone had walked up to him in, let's say, 1980 with a picture of the Green Shadow, would he have signed it? Would he have been willing to admit Oh, yeah, he, it, well, he probably would have stole it. <laughs> Sent it to Norm Keitzer, said it was his. Yeah, and, and who's going to stop him? You know, it's funny, his last big feud was with Jim Cornette. Hey, no, we never had a <laughs> But no, and you know, that's a, now that I... I am able to go back and so many of the historians have researched a lot of this stuff and they've got the, you know, the newspapers.com and all that stuff. Now we can get things we never could get before. I find myself more and more fascinated by these people that not only invented this stuff, but they had to promote and draw crowds and sell tickets with no television, with no there were no interstates. You couldn't like, oh, we'll have a big show and people will come in from all over. It was an all-day deal to go from Louisville to Nashville back then, 180 miles. You had to draw crowds from town with no television, with only newspaper and word of mouth and hanging posters on the walls. And that's why they had to get over in these buildings with their personalities and the heat in the finishes and draw those same people back every week and then get the the big overflows for the special, you know, blow-off matches, grudge matches, mass matches, whatever. But when you go and look at Amarillo, Texas, those guys that we talked about like Dutch Mantell and Cal Farley, the original Dutch Mantell, he's not that old. In 1930, when Amarillo's a cow town with mud fucking streets and they're drawing 7,000 people because everybody in town had to see those two guys fight. 
I love that shit. It's so fascinating to me. For a place like Nashville or a lot of small towns back then that ran wrestling, if you don't have TV, and let's assume most places didn't have radio coverage, you, that means you're basically going on your own programs that you sell at the arenas. Yeah. And whatever you can actually get into the newspaper and word of mouth, like you said, posters being hung up, was a masked heel like the perfect gimmick or the perfect heel for that kind of situation? You know, well, it's almost like a movie serial. What will happen next week with, you know, I mean, the name works, the green shadow, but just more in terms of, will he be unmasked? Will we find out who he is? There's no TV, there's no radio, but they're still intrigued. Yes, and that's the thing is, that's why you had to go live to see, because you weren't even going to see a picture, probably. If You know, if, if you didn't go to the arena, you were not going to see that mask come off, and this could be the week. And think about this. Now, obviously, wrestling has been built on if something works, do it to death, right? Whether it be the, the copies of Buddy Rogers or the copies of the Road Warriors or whatever the case. Masked wrestlers were omnipresent in the Tennessee territories right through to the 80s. That finally, they were mostly job guys, but think about the big, the big main event talent, that the interns, the infernos. All the mass, but at the same time, Nick could pull out the mass superstars. Who are they? We don't even fucking know. If you put a mask on somebody in Tennessee after that for 40 years, it gave them a little something more than what they had to begin with because of the green shadow. Dream machine, early 80s. Dream machine. But I mean, you know, the 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 parade of masked heel tag teams through the 50s and 60s and early 70s and the you know, uh, Jerry Jarrett was fascinated with Mr. Wrestling and kind of created Mr. Wrestling too. And and then he had Dick Steinborn play him when he couldn't get the real yes. one. Yes. And you know, that's the thing is that the Green Shadow uh, there may have been a few other mask guys, you know, before that, but in Nashville, but he was so successful and is so dominant, drew so much money that not only did he had a job in that territory for life, but he influenced as many heels to come along in that territory as Buddy Rogers may have influ influenced nationally to come along and do the same thing. That was where you were going to see masked wrestlers way past the point where it wore off everywhere else because of that legacy. Well, it was quite the legacy, and that was Pat Malone. And as you said, let's end with what you started with. The best drawing heel in Nashville wrestling history. Pat Malone, old pie face. And the meanest man in the world, too. <laughs> Who else do you know that actually would try to saw somebody's head off instead of just stab them and get it over with? But Brian, you know what the, the heart-wrenching part of this thing is? The old-time wrestling, the historical wrestling versus what we got today. No, I do, what the most heart-wrenching part is? The most heart-wrenching thing... Back in those days, those guys had to shave their balls. What? They had to, they all, these guys had balls the size of cantaloupes and they needed shaves. But nowadays, this current crop of wrestlers, well, they can hardly find them if they've got them. And I don't think they have any hairs on them. Like normal people, like you and me and the rest of our audience, it's kind of scarce down there. But for 99%, of the male population of the species of the human race on this planet, you need to get down there and do some maintenance every, every once in a while. And back in the Roy Welch and the Green Shadow and all those guys, Rowdy Red Roberts, I bet you they had literal pontoons of bushes coming out from between their legs because of the oh. amount and size of their balls, but they didn't have the technology back then to be able to do something about it like we've got today. I mean, they were using well, straight razors. Well, I don't want to think about how the, uh, the legends of wrestling shave their testicles, but we could talk about what people today can possibly do to not be them. Well, that's what I'm trying to say, because now with Manscaped, our friends over at Manscaped that we've been praising and talking about and holding up to public praise for, for years now, They've now, they've got a revolutionary new item. You know that the lawnmower has been the greatest personal grooming tool on the planet in the history of the human, in the history of balls, 
But now the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra is out. Not only a new number, but a nickname. It's three times as good as it was before. Well, well listen to this. Why, be- why, why three times? It's the five. It's the Lawnmower 5. Well, it's three times as good as the 4.0. It's because three times it's got, as good as the 4.0. Okay, gotcha. That's right, because it's got a new name, a new nickname, a new number. I'm telling you, this thing has been upgraded. Listen, the two, they feature two next-generation interchangeable, two. two of them, interchangeable skin-safe blade heads. There's a standard trimmer blade and a new foil blade for a smooth finish. You can shellac your boys if you want to. And remember the old one? It had a LED spotlight so you could backlight everything and see what you were trimming. Dual LED spotlights. They provide contrast so you can shed light on even the darkest places. This is going to be like, like Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck on stage with spotlights on them. Overture, curtain lights, this is it, the night of nights. You're going to shave your balls right now, and you're not going to cut yourself and bleed to death. Overture. I'm okay, okay, you. okay. And of course, for those who like a challenge, there's the new disco mode where the lights go on and off, and you have to just yes. hope for the best. And your balls suddenly are covered with mirrors, and they're reflecting everywhere. <laughs> but besides that, the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra comes with a travel case and even a travel lock feature so it doesn't turn on in your bag in the airport and people think you're carrying the Didolator Mach 3 around. Once again, folks, Manscaped has saved your balls. And right now, if you go to manscaped.com, you're going to get 20% off and free shipping with the code DRIVE. 20% off and free shipping this incredible revolutionary new device all you got to do is go to manscape.com and use the code drive and your balls are safe and space age all right i don't know about space age hold on let me see like this space age oh for heaven's sake i knew you were going to do something like that nbc i swear to god that's what it was Boom, boom, boom. That's what it was. That's what I just played. I am a talented musician. I can play can, all sorts of three note jingles <laughs> that you can imagine. Can I see your colorful peacock? You can't. But let me just say before we wrap this up on the topic of. What are we wrapping up? Manscaped. The new Manscaped 5.0 just arrived here uh, two days ago. Very excited to uh, see the packaging. Well, and- God damn it. My, my mail is behind because mine hasn't showed up yet, but I can't wait. To get down in the crack of my ass and start fucking weed whacking. You see, no one needed to hear that. That wasn't what I was hoping you would say. But one more time, what's that promo code, Jim? Manscaped.com promo code DRIVE, 20% off and free shipping. And again, you're going to be sliggered and come on a gold tooth right between your legs. And your uh, partner may really like that, I would assume, I would imagine, unless they are uh, Neanderthals. Well, in, in, unless it's like a department store that your partner's with somebody in, and then you should probably keep your balls to yourself. But anyway, what are you doing over on your <laughs> your own network where you have your own balls this week? We are keeping our balls to ourselves, but letting you enjoy checking out what we do. If that makes any sense or none, find out on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast <laughs> Network on Twitter at Super Podcast or on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. A few notes, of course. The Wrestling News, each and every day. Get your free Wrestling Newscast direct to you every morning. No conjecture, no opinion, no paywall, no clickbait. Just the Wrestling News. Get it today directly from the WrestlingNews.com or subscribe to Arcadian Vanguard's The Wrestling News, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Also want to make mention, this week's edition of Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon, his guest, Gary Michael Capetta, the famed ring announcer. Oh, my friend Gary. Always a great guest, always has great stories. Hear that today, suawpod.com to get it directly, or look for Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon wherever you find your favorite podcasts. The world's most dangerous announcer. You gave him that name, right? I gave him that name because David Letterman gave Paul Schaefer that name. And he reminded me of our Paul Schaefer. 
And of course, David Letterman gave Paul Schaefer that name because he grew up in Indianapolis watching the world's most dangerous wrestler, Dick the Bruiser. And his mom gave him that name. But once again, suawpod.com. Dick the Bruiser, no one... Actually, his mother didn't give him any of those names. Actually, that's true. I was going to say the biggest mystery about Dick the Bruiser is where did he get the name Dick? No one knows, and people think his real name is Richard Affliss. It's not. It's William, correct? Correct. Richard Vychik did that great book years ago on uh, Crowbar Press. Everyone should check it out, The History of Dick the Bruiser. That's not the exact name of the book, but the biography of Dick the Bruiser, the world's most dangerous man, dangerous wrestler. You got well, and, and by the way, he was, he was a dick. Well, now, he was called Dick, referred to as Dick, before he got in wrestling with Dick Affliss. Have you seen? I've seen football pictures. I know I have. So well, he, maybe they were just describing him because that is somewhat of a consensus that he could also be a bit prickly. And you go back and check some footage of him in the 50s, so impressive, like a Brock Lesnar in the ring, and by the late 70s, like a Chris Jericho looking <laughs> self in the ring. But once again, the 605 Super Podcast, the mothership! <laughs> go through the archive today at 605pod.com. The mothership will be landing at some point soon. But go through the archive. The, the mothership? The mother slip. I'm going to send you that in the mail. The mother slip will be, <laughs> the mother ship will be landing soon, uh, or maybe not. But don't try to ship the slip to me. If you ship the shit and slip to me, I'm going to ship the shit and slip right back to you. Thank you to everyone who has been listening to the old shows recently, big surge oh. and recent listeners. But 605pod.com or available wherever you find your favorite podcast. Mothership. Ah, uh, I hate it when you're feeling that healthy. That was for you. That was for yeah. you. Yeah. I thought you were going to say thank thank you to all the people who have been sending the schlip. Anyway, before we go, I guess it is our duty to refer to the episode of As the Bloodline Turns on the Fox Network this past Friday night, October 20th. Some people used to call it SmackDown, but nobody really gets smacked anymore. Nobody goes down. They just talk to each other a lot. Have you? uh, This would have been a great wrestling program for two hours if they'd have if the three little matches hadn't gotten in the way of all of the the dramatics and the emoting don't you think yeah i mean i actually ended up fast forwarding through the wrestling yeah to get to what was gonna happen yeah Yeah. to get to what was gonna happen i wish we'd get these matches out of the way so we could get to what's gonna happen what the fuck is going on? And that's not a statement of, about me as a fan as much as the way they put this show together. Yeah, it's, it's what they're, they're telling you. It's like, you know, we, we put these on in between the segments with the stars that do interesting things. So it's just kind of a placeholder. But I... Hey! Well, that was SmackDown, ladies and no, gentlemen. No, no, if, 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 if they don't care, I don't care. I don't... I don't care, I don't care if I get a mean and stony stare. If I'm not successful, it won't be distressful, because I don't care. All right. It's the best of Kevin Meany here on the Jim Cornette Experience this week. Who is Kevin Meany? All right, well, back to SmackDown. All right, let's get back to the smack. So the smack of the matter was that they recapped the bloodline interaction with John Cena and LA Knight and and the shocking incidents that have gone on that we've already spoken about previously on the previous programs. And there was Paul Lee standing in the ring. They put him right in the middle of the ring because if he gets too far to one side or the other, things t- tends to start tipping. Will you stop? And, How come you can't leave him alone? It's every Well, no, week. he's brilliant. He's the best performer yeah. in the company. I'm about to praise him to the heavens he's about his verbal linguistics good and he's back to the whole i mean it's not only the sharpie hair now but it's like the wide tipped industrial sharpie black marker he's just drawn like six hairs on each side that go back straight back it's brilliant and it's what he has done in the last few months by making his hair part of his emotional state so that it changes color based on what's going on if roman's there or not is one of the most brilliant things he's ever done but now he's wearing makeup, too. Did you notice that? Yeah, he got real pale when Roman was gone. By the end of Roman yes. being gone, he was pale with gray hair. He looked sick. 
yeah, and now he's back to being orange Paul Heyman. <laughs> not one blemish on his face. The, the the hairs, all 12 of them, are black. He's wearing more makeup than Betty Davis and whatever happened to Baby Jane, but he's it's smooth. His whole face is smooth, except they can't do anything about the uh, the bags, though. He's got alligator bags under his eyes. He's worth so much money. But anyway, he was in the ring there, and he was praising... Jimmy for Costin Cody and Jay, the tag team title, and of course had to mention that the the L.A. Times broke the news earlier. Is this is the Los Angeles Times now? There's nothing going on in the world that the L.A. Times it has to resort to breaking news about the WWE title matches because there's a reason why every bozo with a website covers wrestling. And there's a reason why every newspaper or every online news source looks for a way eventually to cover wrestling. Wrestling gets clicks. So once you understand that, you'll play ball. <sighs> That's why, I mean, every, everything, it's Sports Illustrated broke this story. ESPN broke the story. Yeah, you gave them a story and said, here, we'll allow you to run with it and then we'll say you did. Uh, well, Roman is going to defend the uh, the title in Saudi Arabia against L.A. Knight. It was a big exclusive story. The source was WWE. <laughs> and it took a, a tons of, I mean, like a dentistry degree to pull it out of them. A, a serious interrogation. Before you even move on with where this segment goes, can I just say when he said that, I was disappointed. I'm not a big fan of the afternoon shows or giving the big main event. I mean, I understand why yeah. Saudi Arabia's Getting Logan Paul. Well, they're making they're making this. more money on those than they are on the ones they actually expect people to watch and charge for. But it, when you put that as the main event of a Saudi show, it almost sends a message. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but to me, it gives me the feeling, oh, they're not taking him seriously. They're not putting him in the main event of one of the real pay-per-views. It's the sold show in the middle of the day. That's what scares me when I said I don't want him to be yeah. just a stepping stone last time we talked about him. It worries me when I hear that. Well, but perhaps this is the start of uh, an ongoing interaction between the two of them. We can hope. But nevertheless, did you notice, speaking of, I did, well, speaking of I don't know what, but maybe making something a little less important, Paul's standing in the ring, he announces this big match, and they interrupted it for music and graphics to go up over the screen while he still, I thought that was it, that's the end of the, his promo. And the announcers are plugging it, and then they go back to Paul in the ring. So they're now interrupting the live interviews with commercial announcements and reinforcements. It's the difference between the light and the dark. The House of Black have the ability to turn everything off. <laughs> Paul Heyman has the ability to get the cryon set up <laughs> while he's talking. Turn everything. You know, it's never been said about Paul Heyman that he had the ability to turn everything on. Especially the female gender, but nevertheless. <laughs> so he says, so everyone is a fan of L.A. Knight. And if he says, if you are a fan of L.A. Knight, and the fans, of course, go, yeah. Then, and Paul said, don't do that while I'm talking. And just, you know, huge booze for that. But you better watch Crown Jewel because it's the last time you're going to see L.A. Knight. It was a great promo set to match up. And it, bam, here comes L.A. Knight. And he snatches the microphone and he starts intimidating Paul just by his presence and the manner that he's speaking. And Paul is such a great, quivering, flinching. It's almost like you can imagine that's what Tony Khan looked like when Punk was yelling at him, right? He's just trembling. And at first, L.A. Knight says, get out of the ring and I'm going to talk. And then he tries to go. He says, no, wait a minute, come back here. And so L.A. Knight again. He worked it perfect, and Paul's reactions were great. And he, you know, he, he said, go ahead and tell me what you think Roman Reigns is going to do. Well, anyway, he finally tells Paulie off, and he says, tell Roman Reigns whose game this is, L.A. Knight. And boom, and he leaves. And it was a good segment because the babyface came out and had some bass in his voice, and wasn't intimidated, and didn't get the shit kicked out of him already. And when you think, six months ago, this guy was Max Dupree, and Vince probably wasn't a fan, 
for the same of, of LA Knight for the same reason why the fans are fans of him. Cause he acts like a fucking wrestler. He doesn't come out there and worry about who his friends are and say it's always been his dream. He used to live wake at night with a little chubby and hope he'd be on the TV and thank you for the opportunity. He acts like a fucking wrestler. That's why the fans like him. What'd you think of this oratorial performance? It was a good opening segment once we finally got to it. Once we, what, what was it, six minutes of recaps or whatever before Heyman it, even said it a was, word? Seven it, it minutes? It was a while. Well, we were 15, better than 15 minutes deep in the show just when this was over. Heyman's great out there. You know, if I could ask Paul Heyman one question, and I don't even know how exactly I would phrase it, when did he learn to appreciate simplicity? You know, I feel yes. like in the early days, he was good. I was always a fan of his, but he was trying to do a lot and it was almost too much at times, but it worked for him, for that character. But now it's like he's learned either because of age and he has to, or just yes. whatever it is. It feels like he's appreciated that you don't have to do as much and you can go further with that. Well, and that's the thing. And, and you're right in large part is that, yeah, I wouldn't be out there doing the, you know, machine gun promos for three minutes nonstop on TBS now because it's 40 years fucking later and I got to breathe every once in a while. And with Paul the psycho yuppie, he was expected to be bouncing off the walls and out of control. Uh, but as he gained both maturity and 150 pounds, he couldn't do that and he was never really physically gifted in that aspect of, you know, the business, but he, he ain't going to be taking bumps. Now I wouldn't be taking bumps. Now I could, I just don't want to, I'd hurt myself. Um, but so, and part of that is, and he's different. He's older. He's the wise man now. Whereas I would probably, and, and have been in my various appearances more of the cranky old man rather than the you know motor mouth kid running around i would still if i was managing i would have to be more active at ringside than he is at least reacting and stressing or gloating or glorifying or whatever because that's just me and i'm hyper anyway but that was that opening segment and what'd you say it ended at 15 minutes well it, it was a little bit uh, somewhere around there Somewhere around 15 minutes deep because the next match or the I, first match, we'll go ahead. I'll just say, though, I mean, and again, I'm a wrestling fan, but the realities of what this show is, at this point in time, when SmackDown begins with a match, I'm disappointed. You always oh, yeah. expect it now to begin with the segment that will lay out usually what the story for the whole episode is, the story you've been waiting a week to see or hear anything about. If they don't begin with a segment like this, I'm almost disappointed at this point. And it's different than one of the raw ones. It really is. Well, yeah, and but also part of it may be that if they open with a match, it's going to be somebody you probably don't want to see. Whereas if it's if they open with this live interview, it's with one of the biggest deals going on in the company. But that's the problem. Look at this SmackDown specifically. Every single match that was on the show very easily just could have been the opening match of SmackDown. The matches didn't matter at all. It was all about yeah. these segments. But anyway, to your point, a good opening they, segment. Well, yes, and they just had to break them up with the matches to, you know, fill in the time until they did something big again. And that's what I'm saying with this. The match, the first match was Escobar and Montez Ford. And by the time that was over, we were a little bit past 30 minutes into the show. And they didn't. They didn't have a goddamn half hour Broadway or whatever, so we it they're filling up time. You see, there's and, there are things that you care about on a week to week basis, and then there are things, at least for me, that I'm willing to wait until the pay per view to watch a match without commercials to see if I care at all about this stuff. But like, yes, I don't want to invest time in the LWO versus the Street Profits and Lashley. It just doesn't do it for me. Well, and also, again, the finish, real briefly, was Ford was on the floor, and Escobar walks over to the ropes, and he sees Ford kneeling or kind of bent over. He's in a stationary position on the floor by the apron. And Escobar grabs the top rope, and what is it, the plancha? Where he just jumps up and goes sideways over the thing, not head first? Is that what that is, the plancha? 
Uh, the plancha is which? What did you say? He just pulls on the rope and jumps over yes. and just drops down sideways. That is a plancha, and a tope, I believe, is through the ropes. Well, whatever the fuck it was, he jumped over the top rope, and the guy wasn't moving, but he missed him completely anyway. He just went down beside of him and lightly slapped him on the back with his hand. I'm like, what the? And one of the announcers said, a glancing blow. And then he rolled him back in, but then Dawkins, the partner, was there to post him. So apparently, I guess Ford forgot, hey, maybe I should stand up and catch this fucking guy because he's got to be out here. I don't know. So Dawkins posts him. The other LWO guy attacks Dawkins. Dawkins nails him. Escobar hits Dawkins, slides in, and Ford rolls him up and pulls tights one, two, three. And then they beat him up a little more, and here comes Carlito and makes a save. The heels just powder, no contact. So, okay, they're all still mad. And now we're 30 minutes into the fucking show. Did you see the purely dreary segment? No, I thought we had a deal. We didn't have to watch them. Well, I, I watched it on Fast Forward just to describe what it was because even I was surprised that they went to a, have a spa day and they were soaking their feet when the brawling brutes came into the spa oh, no. and attacked them from behind and gave them swirlies in the foot baths. So apparently they're doing one segment on every program now for the AEW fans. Who's going to take care of the spa owner? I don't know. That poor lady because, saved up her whole life to have her own spa, and then these wrestlers come in and tear it up? Moved all the way over here from Prague to start that business from, from scratch, and what happens? Officer, I knew something was wrong as soon as these two guys walked in. <laughs> yeah, they didn't look like they belonged here. <laughs> But what, what, who is this entertaining to? How starved for entertainment would you have to be? Are you talking about somebody that's been in a medically induced coma for 30 years and is just glad to be able to see colors again? Are you talking about someone from the deepest, darkest jungles of Antarctica that's never seen television? Maybe they do one segment a week for Vince. <sighs> Anyway, then we get back to a little bloodline business because Paulie and Solo were in the locker room and Jimmy came in and he's all happy and he's bragging about Raw and he's doing the motor mouth thing and he's aggravating Paulie. And then this was a new one. They were in their locker room, right? Paul, Solo, Jimmy Uso. And as Jimmy's doing that, Paul looks up toward behind where the camera is and suddenly is like, ooh, like he sees something. And then they cut to a shot of Cena in the parking garage walking into the building to the arena. But we didn't see that on the monitor because the shot wasn't up on a television monitor until Paul reacted to it. So how did, does he have x-ray vision that he looked through the wall and saw Cena walking into the building? As much as I'm against wacky gimmicks, X-Ray Vision Paul Heyman is one I'm interested in. They may be, he might be able to make it work. He could make it work. He wouldn't abuse his powers. He would know when to use it, who to use it with, where the camera I've, was. I have a feeling he'd spend a lot of time outside the women's locker room. All right, so, but however he saw him or foretold of his presence reading the tea leaves or whatever. We come back from the break. Here comes John Cena. And again, it's he comes out like a star. Not only are the people reacting, but have, remember I've talked about numerous times on all these programs, especially AEW with the not ready for primetime players over there who've never been on television at all and nobody's been able to get it through to them how to do it. They just walk down to the ring like a goddamn guy waiting on a bus, hangnail page, or jungle boy, just mope on down. John Cena comes out like a star. He's got energy. He's got emotion. He's fired up. He's making it an, an event. He doesn't just come out in sweatpants and a hoodie with moop face. It, 
How is this hard to figure out? I don't know how, but it's interesting how few guys come up today with the idea of being a star or treating themselves like stars, like guys like John Cena figured out how to do. Instead, it's a sea of Garganos. Oh my, the Gargano Sea. The Gargano Sea. That's when That's when where you go. You're speaking of moop face, that's where you go. <laughs> when you are programmed with, with Johnny Same Face, that means you're you're being banished to the Gargano Sea. All right. Well, anyway, here for Cena, the fans chanted, Thank you, Cena. And it was a big ovation, blah, blah, blah. But he started to promo, he's down. Because everybody's talking about the streak. He's got a 2002-day streak going of not winning a televised singles match. His last win was in 2018. And, of course, how many matches has he had the past five years? And then televised single matches even fewer than that. Blah, 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 right? But it was great they came up with that because the people automatically thought he was teasing, talking about retirement. And he led them down that path and teased it, but then turned it around and said, but I believe in myself, I believe in the fans, I believe in all this, and now's the time to turn the math around. It's going to be a bad night for anybody brave enough to walk through that curtain because I'm going to win a match, right? And that was they brought the house down. They loved that. Yes, get somebody, anybody out there. We want to see this. And here comes Solo the solo music and he's making the entrance and people are like, Oh shit. And he steps in the ring. And at that point, Brian, did you notice what I noticed when solo and Cena are in the ring for this match that he's challenged for? I'm not sure. What did you notice? There was no referee. Well, the, yeah, of course it was. He, there, he was accepting a challenge, not necessarily a match. Well, no, but the, no, he said, I have gone five years Without a winning a televised singles match, and tonight is the time to turn the math around and change all that. It's going to be a bad night for anybody brave enough to walk through the curtain. Solo comes out, but there's no referee. There's no announcement. They just get in a fight. And then immediately, Jimmy comes in, super kick. Of course, it was one foot away from Cena's head, and then Solo threw kicks like, Cena was a Fabergé egg because they don't want to hurt the Golden Goose. But then a hooded figure comes down and pulls Jimmy out and starts wailing on him, and it's Jay. And they have a big fight on the floor, and the security, the referees come out. And in the ring, Cena ducks a spike and gives Solo the attitude adjustment. And the heels powder. And at that point, Cena's the only one in the ring. Even Jay's still out on the floor or wherever. And Cena does the big celebration and people are going crazy. He's celebrating not winning a match. But it worked. That whole thing was concocted just to get John Cena out there to take one bump and do two moves or whatever. And it was, and the people didn't, they didn't give a shit. They, they reacted to that like it was a 30 minute fucking match. Instead of the 30-minute matches that they have that they've made unimportant and nobody reacts to at all. They react better to Cena now than they did in his it, what we would consider yes. his prime. Yes, they were booing the shit out of him then. Yeah. But much like with TNA, modern wrestling has created a situation where people are nostalgic for fucking Drek. That moment where Jay Uso took off the hood and revealed his face and the audience reaction... He's the perfect example of a guy I love in all these segments. And when I see him wrestle, it's like, eh, eh. you know, I'll wait for the finish and whatever's going to happen with the drama. But he's awesome in every segment he's in. And Cena is as over today as he's ever been. And they keep getting him on these shows until he goes back to work. The act, See, I think they thought he was going to go back and the actors are still on strike. The writer's strike was settled. The actors oh. are still on strike. Well, are, are the actors being pricks about this whole thing they're better than the writers no i think the studios may be the ones being pricks and they don't want to give the actors you know again the actors have a lot of concerns whether it's revenue from various forms of technology that were not there in the past or the future of ai and how it would affect basically creating rope not robot but 
synthetic versions of these actors in the future. <laughs> so there's a lot of questions that have to be answered, but... Hey, yeah, that'd be a great thing for the studios to put in or for the WWE to put in. If you get hurt during the filming of our fucking deal or during our program with you on our television, we have the right to substitute an AI-generated hologram in your place. Think of how many things in wrestling history would have changed if no one ever needed time off. You could finish whatever program you had booked. Good Lord. For the positive and the negative, that would be mind-altering. Mind anyway, speaking of altering people's minds, so apparently now there's going to be issues between Adam Pierce and Nick Aldis, the various general managers of the two programs, because Jey Uso was pissed off in the back, but Aldis and Pierce were arguing about whether it was Jimmy's fault or Jay's fault, because one screwed up one guy's match on his show and the other guy screwed it up, blah, blah, blah. So Aldis finds Jay $10,000 and kicks him out of the building. And Jay ain't going to go. And Adam Pierce says, I'll, I'll walk you out. Jay, it's okay. And then Aldis said, that's a good idea. Security, take both of them out. And then Pierce said, are you really going to kick me out of this building? You heard what I said. Well, let the games begin. So now we're going to have general manager strife and turmoil here. I, I, that'll be better than the matches. You know what? I'm all for it. If they treat it seriously, these yes. two guys could pull it off. And watching the gamesmanship between these two on this show would be good. And this is a way to... I, I joked about it last week. We had to get Pierce versus Aldis at WrestleMania. I they mean, might do it. I think they may do it. And I may want to see it. And I may want to see it. Yeah, and it'll probably be better than 90% of the other things that they'll have on the program. It's better than having Aldis as another, you know, baby face authority figure. Pierce has done good in that role because there's been nothing egregious. Like, it never, like, he had a wacky period where he just became a heel. But Aldis being a dickish authority figure who has Triple H's blessing is an interesting twist. They could really do something with that. I'm I'm just uh I'm putting my money on on Pierce with the pile driver to go over in the in the in the match. Oh. But I, I'm putting my money on all this. He'll get Pierce in some kind of uh maybe crossface and have Mickey James start singing. No! No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Oh, come on. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. She's actually talented. She is very good. But speaking of very good. The next segment was very long. At the 9 o'clock hour, they send Logan Paul to the ring. And again, and again, another star, another big name. And he does the promo, and he has a great, as we've talked about, heel dickish demeanor, which is probably, from what we hear, very true to life. And he brags about winning the fight he was in last week so easily and, you know, knocked the guy but now he's here uh, talking about uh, Rey Mysterio, saying, that, you know, everybody's thought I was going to call him out tonight. Well, I've already beat him a long time ago. But a lot has changed now because Rey has the U.S. title and Logan Paul wouldn't mind having that. So as it gets to the point where the crowd starts whatting him, here comes Rey Mysterio music and entrance and interrupts. And... He cut, tries to. <sighs> the thing is, when they put Ray, in, when Ray was Ray Mysterio, and he didn't have to talk all the time, he could do his shit. It seems to me like that he was cooler. But now that everybody knows he's old enough to have a son that's a foot taller than him, and he has to come out and respond to people in these dramatic readings that they do now in wrestling does it take some of the superhero cool off of him just the vibe what do you think i don't think so i mean this isn't like you know how many guys that you were around in your life had a problem with their kid getting into the business because they didn't want themselves to look old you know some guys looked old already Vern Gagne looked like an old man like by the time greg got in yeah Lawler Vern Gagne got it looked like an old man by the time greg was born yeah but Lawler didn't Dundee was kind of midway, <laughs> but 
I don't think it takes away anything from Rey Mysterio. At well, all no, but no, but what, I'm not talking about the son necessarily. I'm talking about the whole thing where now he has to talk a lot and he has the higher pitched voice and he has to, and he was all action. Rey Mysterio, the cool matches and the cool outfit. And now they've got him out here trying to be an actor like everybody else. And, you know, the material was fine. If you want the U.S. title, you remind me of Dominic. Great ability, lots of potential, and a big mouth. And then they say something in Spanish. And if you want the U.S. title, I'll give you the chance at Crown Jewel. And then both of them said something in Spanish. And then Logan Paul offers his hand, and Ray kind of reaches out, but is reluctant, and Logan grabs it and shakes it and walks off. You didn't do that justice. That took a minute. Well, yeah, it, it was it was very long. It was like a weirdly long set up to the handshake of them slowly going in. I've never seen it that slow take that long. Were they told, draw out the handshake, make it go as long as you can. It was awkward. It, it, at one point, it was almost like Ray had gotten frozen and he was like, I, I can't move. But I mean, you know, they, they're doing this, I guess, with Logan Paul, because again, like, who was it with Ricochet? So we can have some flying going on, I guess. But uh, this is kind of a manufactured blood feud, isn't it? Reason, backstory, reason for something to take place. Besides that they want a high spot match. I think they just want a Logan Paul match in Saudi Arabia. Well, there you go. So then, oh my God, Austin Theory is now a regular tag team partner of Grayson Waller. We can't get away from it. And they had a tag team match against Cameron Grimes and Dragon Lee, Bruce's younger nephew. And uh, to recap, Austin Theory is great. He's saddled with this slug as a partner, and that's going to do nothing for him because as good as he is, anything he's Grayson Waller is attached to is not going to work. I'm just telling you right now. And they're using Grimes as a preliminary guy, so the people don't really care about him. And there was four minutes total of this match on the air on two sides of a three-minute break. So the heels won. Did I miss any uh, minute examination? I didn't watch it, but this is a match I probably would have wanted to watch. But again, you know... You wouldn't have seen much of it. That's the point. You know if there's a match, especially at this point in the show on SmackDown, it's just going to be commercials in between the next talking segment. If this was on a pay-per-view, I would watch this, and based on the four people in it, or the three people in Grayson Waller, I'd probably enjoy it. But it's not worth... If you're going through SmackDown and you're not watching it live, it's not worth it to watch the matches because you're not watching... You're not watching matches, you're watching clips of matches. Yeah. In between commercials. Uh, so then Kathy Kelly sat down on Kevin Owens. No, I'm sorry, sat down with Kevin Owens. And talking about the bombshell trade now where... Owens had to go to SmackDown because Jay came to Raw, even though we've shot the complete shit out of that by illustrating that the trade was the the draft was never even. They drafted five people in one pick at one point. So but he's not happy by being separated from his lifelong life partner, Sami Zayn. And they didn't get a chance to regain the tag team title. But SmackDown's a new opportunity. And new faces that he's never had matches with. And the, the new faces that he said he'd never had matches with were Rey Mysterio, Seamus, and the Brawling Brutes. If he came over just for that, he might should have stayed home. I got nothing to add to this. Kevin Owens versus the Brawling Brutes. I can't wait. I can't wait to fast forward. And next week, do not fast forward through Fox Network because SmackDown won't be on it. It's FS1 next week. And basically, they were out of talking segments at that point, so they put one more match on <laughs> for the women's title, Charlotte versus EO Sky. And again, I love Charlotte. I'm not in any way interested really in watching a girl one foot shorter than her that they've put in this heel group with Bailey 
continue to fucking have the same match they always have. But, fortunately, there wasn't really a lot to fucking avoid because they did five minutes of entrances and introductions, and then the bell rang, and Charlotte tripped EO, and EO slid out to the fucking floor, and they went to the break in 10 seconds. And when they came back, they went three more minutes and had a nice few minutes of a match and went to break again. And I'm, I'm sure that Charlotte can have a good match with a Walmart cashier, but I need to get to the fucking point here. So, for the finish, Charlotte dumped Bailey over the announce desk. Uh, what's the other girl's name that's hurt? Tegan Knox. No, that's right? Dakota, Dakota Sky. Dakota, Dakota Kai. Sky. Dakota Kai. <laughs> Dakota Kai. Dakota Kai. Do you have to say it like that? Dakota Kai. You have to say Dakota Kai. Dakota Kai. Well, Dakota Kai drew the referee, and EO grabbed the belt. When Charlotte hit EO with a spear, she speared the belt head first and knocked her own self out. And EO Sky pinned Charlotte one, two, three, which is on par with the angle that I did where I actually pinned Bullet Bob Armstrong in Knoxville after he had already been knocked completely unconscious by one of my heels. It's that much of an upset in my mind. I don't know what the fuck they're thinking. It was like uh, Millie Vanilli winning American Idol over Frank Sinatra. But then the heels got some heat. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, Cinderella story, Bianca Belair reappeared and made a big comeback and helped Charlotte out and cleared the ring. And that was the whole wrestling program. Yes, it was. Another match I probably would have watched, but it was on SmackDown, broken up by commercials, so I didn't. It was on a pay-per-view. I'd really enjoy it, but that was SmackDown. And again, 10 seconds has to be a new world record, right? To go to break after the bell. Possibly. And if the world title match was so important, why wouldn't you take breaks in the entrances rather than in the actual contest? Do they, do they take breaks in the Super Bowl while the game is actually being played? No. No. Okay. Anywho. That was that. This is my show, isn't it? It sure is. You're wrong about that. What? It has been my show, but it's over now. Well, we used to do a show, but it's all over now. Tune in to Brian's Ugh. show in a day or two or Ugh. three or whenever we have the energy to do this you again. Know, and it's, it's one thing when you decide to butcher Southern classics or whatever it is that you sing, but when you decide to go to the Stones, that's where I get truly offended. Well... I'll go to the Stones, and you go back to your balls. Listen to you sing Brian Jones had it easy. Hey, that's uh, just keep me away from swimming pools. Anyway, in parting, we want to wish you love, peace, and Stones, and we'll see you next week or whenever. Bye-bye, everybody, and fuck you and thanks. <laughs>